Your Immortal Reality How to Break the Cycle of Birth and Death Gary R. Renard This book is lovingly and respectfully dedicated to all those who love A Course in Miracles, or who are just about to discover it for themselves. Who is the you who are living in this world? Spirit is immortal, and immortality is a constant state. A Course in Miracles Prologue In the 1880s there was a rich rancher who lived in Texas. He was not a particularly spiritual dude, but he was very good at manifesting abundance, making some of his neighbors suspect that the two things weren't necessarily connected. He did claim to be a Christian, but his actions in the world made this claim a doubtful one. One day, a poor farmer who had no food sneaked onto the rich rancher's land and stole one of his chickens so that his family could eat. He was caught by one of the ranch hands and brought to the rancher. There were a lot of things the rancher could have said, but all he said was, hang him. It'll teach him a lesson. A couple of years later, a man from Mexico was trespassing on the rancher's land. He was very poor and hoping to find a new life. What he found was the rancher's men, who took him to their boss. After looking the trespasser over, all the rancher said was, hang him. It'll teach him a lesson. There were many episodes like this in the rich rancher's life, in which he never stopped to put himself in other people's shoes but simply reacted in anger and judged and condemned them, usually ending with the phrase, hang him. It'll teach him a lesson. Then one night the rancher's body died, and he saw himself going up toward the pearly gates of heaven. The rancher was hoping that no one would recognize him and maybe he could just walk in. But right before he got to the gate, Saint Peter stepped in front of him and said, Wait a minute. Jesus wants to talk to you. Now the rancher was very worried. He remembered some of the things he had done in his life, and here he was, about to be judged by Jesus himself. Suddenly, the rancher was shaking in his boots. Jesus appeared, walked slowly up to the rancher, looked him right in the eyes, and then said to Saint Peter, Forgive him. It'll teach him a lesson. Arden and Persa A good translator although he must alter the form of what he translates, never changes the meaning. In fact, his whole purpose is to change the form so that the original meaning is retained. In the two years since I had last seen Artin and Persa, my life had been turned upside down, and I didn't know that it was just the beginning. I wasn't sure if my ascended master friends, who appeared to me from out of nowhere as very real-looking bodies, would ever return. In fact, the last question I asked them was, will I ever see you again? To which Artin replied, that's up to you and the Holy Spirit, dear brother. You should talk to him about it, as you should everything else. I did talk to the Holy Spirit, and listened. I used the method of true prayer, which was actually a form of meditation and joining with God which Arden and Persa had taught me. A fringe benefit of this was inspiration, a way of receiving guidance through the mind as to what I should do or what decisions I should make. The last time Arden and Persa left, I heard their voices combined into one, as the voice of the Holy Spirit. This reminded me of an earlier experience I had of hearing the voice of Jesus, whom my teachers usually referred to simply as J. In pondering the difference between J.S. voice and that of others, I couldn't help but think about Brian Wilson of the Beach Boys. As a musician and admirer of Wilson's, I knew that he had never heard his own music in stereo, because he was deaf in one ear. So he only heard part of it. When I heard J.S. voice, it was as if I were hearing in stereo for the first time. Every voice I had heard before that had something missing but J.S. voice was full, whole, and complete. Just as Wilson would surely be amazed to hear the full range of the sound of his own great music, I was amazed to hear the full range of the sound of J.S. voice, knowing that it was really my own voice, 
the voice that speaks for God. This was also what the combined voice of Artan and Persa sounded like, and it had stayed with me. Now I could hear it much more clearly, and the guidance I received did not fail me. It didn't always fit my pictures, but it always seemed to work in some way that was best for everyone, not just me. Indeed, this was a hallmark of the Holy Spirit's guidance. He could see everything, where I could only see a small part. So the Holy Spirit's guidance was good for one and all. This was sometimes annoying. I wanted what was good for me, and I wanted it now. Yet I had to admit that in retrospect, my ideas would have failed, and the Holy Spirit's ideas would have worked. Plus, the Holy Spirit already knew everything that was going to happen, and I didn't. So whose judgment was likely to be the most dependable? I was determined to listen, and I was usually successful. He could see everything, where I could only see a small part. So the Holy Spirit's guidance was good for one and all. Note, the Holy Spirit, being one and whole, is not male or female, which is a concept of separation and the resulting opposites that reflect separation instead of oneness. The correct word to describe the Holy Spirit would be it. However, for artistic purposes, Arden and Persa used he, and so will I. It should be understood that this is metaphor, and not meant to be taken literally or seriously. If some prefer to call the Holy Spirit a she, then as far as I'm concerned, they are more than welcome to do so, but that is no more accurate than using the word he. At the end of 2001, when Arden and Persa had left, I had no intention of ever speaking in public. My plan was to put out the book and let it take care of itself. Persa had asked, rhetorically, because she already knew everything, early in our discussions, you don't like to speak to a crowd of people, do you? My response was, I'd rather stick broken pieces of glass up my butt. That attitude had begun to slowly change when I went for the first time to the annual A Course in Miracles conference in Bethel, Maine, in October of 2001, shortly after the 9-11 tragedy. In the 1990s, I had almost become a recluse, living in rural Maine without much social contact. One exception to this was a Course in Miracles study group I started going to in 1993, about six months after Arden and Persa's first visit. It was a small, comfortable group that I would attend for 11 years, making some good friends but not challenging myself in terms of interacting with people. I first heard of the annual Bethel Conference in 1993 and decided to go, but I didn't. I also meant to go every year after that from 1994 through 2000, but I never went. In 2001, the ninth year in a row of promising myself I would go, I finally did. It's a good thing. It was the final time they would ever have the conference. Of course there's no such thing as an accident. The fact that I knew that my book The Disappearance of the Universe was almost done, Arden and Persa had promised me one more visit by the end of the year combined with the 9-11 tragedy had started to light a fire under me. I'm not a high-energy person, and it's always good for me to have extra motivation. I found the people at Bethel, who were mostly from the New England and New York areas, to be the most loving people I had ever encountered, and it made me want to meet with more spiritual students. However, speaking in public was still not on my radar. While at the conference, I also met one of the earliest teachers of A Course in Miracles, John Mundy. John would play a role in changing my mind about public speaking. While John was in the makeshift bookstore selling some of his products, he became the first person I would go up to and say that two ascended masters were appearing to me and I was writing a book about it. His reaction was not enthusiastic, but it was not judgmental either. After December 21st, which was my Ascended Master friend's final visit, I took the next three months to finish typing and proofreading the manuscript. 
My teachers had told me what to do with the book. This was the only information they gave me that, per their instructions, was not included in disappearance. Their plan didn't match mine. My idea would have been to take the book to a big New York publisher, have it sell a million copies in six months, and move to Hawaii. They said no and gave me their blueprint. I was very naive, and didn't have a clue about the realities of publishing or the politics of the divided, though mostly loving, family that is referred to as the coarse community that would await me. The first pleasant surprise that would come about as a result of following the guidance of my visitors was the amazingly easy time I had getting approved by the foundation for a course in miracles to use the hundreds of quotations from the course that my teachers had spoken in the book. It had been many years since a book was allowed to use so much of the course, and I had heard stories of people waiting for a year for an answer and then being declined. I had gone to Roscoe, New York, a couple of times to attend workshops by Ken Wapnick, the friend of course scribe Helen Skookman, who was now the premier teacher of the course, and who also controlled its copyright. I met with Ken in between sessions approaching him as guided with an attitude of respect and cooperation. He responded with kindness and a good sense of humor. Later, in April of 2002, I sent Ken the manuscript in order for him to go over and approve the quotations from the course. The foundation sent me a letter of permission to use all of the quotes just one month later. Note, not long after, a maverick judge who displayed little public respect for A Course in Miracles, would invalidate the course's copyright over the seldom used and dubious issue of prior distribution. The next pleasant surprise that would come about as a result of following the guidance of my visitors was the amazingly easy time I had getting the book published. I was a completely unknown author with no credentials and a strange story about two beings appearing to me on my living room couch. I didn't know that I didn't have a sucker's chance in hell of finding a mainstream publisher, but I did know I had been told to send the manuscript to D. Patrick Miller, the sole proprietor, and only employee, of Fearless Books in Berkeley, California. Patrick had never published a book by anybody else, only his own. When he read my manuscript, he said, I think you've got something here, and decided to make an exception. By October we had a deal. The official publication date was May 1, 2003, although advance copies of the book were being read by our first 100 online customers in March. Those first readers had bought the book based on some excerpts Patrick had placed on his website. In fact, there were three books that had been many years in the making that were all published at the same time, beyond belief. The Secret Gospel of Thomas, by Elaine Pagels, The Da Vinci Code, by Dan Brown, and The Disappearance of the Universe, which some readers immediately began referring to as D.U. It amazed me how certain ideas churned around in the unconscious and then would rise up to the surface of public consciousness when the time was just right. These three books explored many of the same themes. The difference with DU was that it contained not only the teachings of A Course in Miracles, which the other books didn't, but also a major clarification of those teachings. This was a gift to both longtime students of the course as well as beginners who would be introduced to the course through DU, although most beginners probably couldn't appreciate how much time was being saved for them by reading it. I remember less than a year later hearing Doug Hoff a teacher at the Association for Research and Enlightenment, the Edgar Cayce Group in Virginia Beach, tell his students that reading DU would save them 20 years when it came to studying the course. I realized that was not only true, but that it was clear that such an accomplishment could not have been done by me alone. This helped prevent me from letting things go to my head. If I wasn't responsible for most of the content of the book, then there was no reason for me to feel special about it. In October of 2002, once I had a publisher, I sent an email to John Mundy and told him more details about the book. He didn't answer me. Annoyed, 
I forgave him after a little while. Although I didn't always forgive things immediately, I always forgave them eventually. It was that quality of perseverance that would enable me to continue to practice the course during what was to come. After the book was published, in the spring of 2003, I got a phone call. It was John Mundy. He told me that he was reading the book, and his reaction was, wow. He also said that he was coming to Portland, Maine, to do a workshop at the Unity Church, and he thought it would be a good idea for me to come. He said I didn't have to speak, but he'd introduce me to the crowd and tell them about the book. I went, and when John introduced me, I quickly stood up and shyly said, hi, and then sat down just as quickly. That was my first speaking engagement. We went to dinner later, and John said, you're going to get out there and speak about this, right? I said no, I didn't think I could. John said, that's all right, Gary, but if you don't, then people will never know for sure what your experience was. Some of them won't be certain if it's all true or if you made some of it up. That got me thinking. Then, as we continued talking, John invited me to come to New York City in the fall and present a workshop that he would sponsor. I could hardly believe it when I heard myself say yes. As soon as I left that night, I started trying to think of a way to get out of it. I still had no real intention of talking in front of people and made no effort to do so. I was also procrastinating about telling John that I didn't want to come to Manhattan. I then decided to handle my problem of procrastination, if I got around to it. Then, that summer I got a call from a woman in Massachusetts named Vicki Poppy. She told me that she was coming up to Maine to do a prayer circle on Peaks Island, off the coast of Portland. She asked me to come. That sounded pretty cool to me, as Maine is nice in the summer, and I had never gone out on the ferry before. Vicky brought about ten people with her. Then when we were on the island, she suddenly said, Hey, Gary, why don't you tell us about your experiences with Artan and Persa? I had been letting the Holy Spirit in, and I was pretty relaxed on that hot, sunny afternoon. I went ahead and told the people in the circle what it was like to be visited by my teachers. Afterward, on the way back to the ferry, Vicky came up to me and said, You know, Gary, you just told your story to ten people. If you can tell your story to ten people, you can tell your story to a hundred people. What's the difference? It's all an illusion. If you can tell your story to ten people, you can tell your story to a hundred people. What's the difference? It's all an illusion. Vicky knew that I was supposed to go to New York in November, and she said, I'll tell you what. You can come and do a workshop at my house. If you don't like it, then you don't have to do it again. But at least try it once. I gave in and said yes. I thought, how many people are going to come to her house? Vicky has a house on Adams Street in Quincy, Massachusetts across the street from the home of President John Quincy Adams. The book was being read, and I was amazed by how many people came that first weekend of September. But what really surprised me were the people themselves. They were so open, so loving, and so supportive that I was almost overwhelmed. I figured, if this is what it's going to be like, then how can I lose? With these spiritual type people, even if I suck, they're supposed to forgive me. Although I actually did a pretty good job for my first workshop, I was so nervous before I went on that I said, I don't want to do this anymore. But something interesting happened about 20 minutes after I started. I had the group do the form of meditation that my teachers had taught me, which is also a form of prayer and joining with God. After doing so, I felt as if I were connected with something higher than myself. After that point in the presentation, 
it was as if I wasn't the one doing the workshop anymore. It was more like I was watching myself as the Holy Spirit sent the messages through me. I thought, hey, maybe I should let the Holy Spirit take over sooner. The next time I spoke, I did exactly that. Two months later I was in New York City, the place where I thought I'd be the most nervous, speaking for about the fourth time in public, and feeling less nervous in front of a crowd than I ever had. The book was gaining momentum, selling more copies every month than the month before. It wasn't huge yet, but it was getting noticed, and more speaking offers came in. I didn't know how far I wanted to take this. Did I just want to speak a few times, or did I want to get serious about doing it more and even start traveling long distances? I hadn't flown anywhere. I had only driven to a few places in New England and once to New York. I was at a crossroads. Then, on December 20, 2003, I found myself at Vicky Poppy's house once again, this time for a Christmas party. I had gone there with Karen, my wife of 21 years. We spent the night, and then on the next day, December 21, prepared to drive home to Maine. I said to Vicky, you know, I have a feeling something's going to happen. She said, I feel it, too, and I have an idea what it is. There was no need to say anything else. Late that night I was sitting in the living room of the same apartment in Auburn, Maine, where Artin and Persa had paid their last three visits, having moved there from the house in Poland Spring where their appearances had begun eleven years earlier to the day. Suddenly, I felt a presence in the room. I had to turn to my left because the couch was pointed in the same direction that my chair was, toward the TV set. I looked over and became ecstatic at the sight of my two old friends, sitting there on the same couch they had sat on for almost all of their visits. I exclaimed, Arden and Persa, and then ran over and hugged both of them. I wouldn't realize until later that it was the first time I had ever touched Arden, the man, although I had touched Persa, the woman, once before. They looked the same as ever, my beautiful Persa and that guy. I thought it was interesting that I didn't actually see them appear, because I recalled that this was also the case during the very first visit they had made eleven years earlier. I sat down with wobbly knees from the excitement of seeing them. Persa then began to speak. Persa, hey, dear brother. How's it going? Has anything interesting happened since the last time we saw you? Just kidding. You know we're always aware of everything that you're doing. Arden, yes. For example, you were just reading about that guy in Germany who killed somebody and then ate him. It's a big story there. He's accused of cannibalism, and now they're putting him on trial. Gary, yeah. There's no such thing as a free lunch. Persa, I'm glad to see your smart-ass tendencies haven't been completely cured. You may need them by the time we're finished with you. Gary, oh yeah? What did you have in mind? Arden, all in good time, Gary. Gary, wait. Let me put on the recorder. It's so great to see you guys. I can hardly believe it. I had a feeling about it, though, being our anniversary and all. Note, December 21st is the feast day for St. Thomas, and Persa had identified herself as being Thomas, a man, in that incarnation two thousand years ago. Arden had identified himself as being St. Thaddeus at that time. Persa, we know. So let's get right down to business, just like before. We've come back to tap people on the shoulder, so to speak. Although for some it may seem like getting tapped on the shoulder with a sledgehammer. There's an important reason for that. We want to help keep people focused. It's by applying advanced, or quantum, forgiveness, which we'll explain 
that you can most quickly experience your immortal reality. We are here to instruct you on how to break the cycle of birth and death, once and for all. Gary, is that all? I was hoping I could learn how to measure my consciousness. Arden, you're being facetious. But what you just said is one of the reasons we're here. People are being distracted by things that may seem fascinating to them but are really only there to take their attention away from what's important, and instead put it on things that will keep them stuck here. Persa, we'll get into that more. But to start, let's point out that most spiritual students spend almost all of their time in the phase of gathering information. This is encouraged by the belief that the more spiritual information they put in their heads, the more enlightened they'll be. So they jump around from one thing to another, reading dozens of books on different spiritual subjects. During our first series of visits with you, we referred to it as the spiritual buffet line. Now there's nothing wrong with learning information. Indeed, it gives people a necessary background. The problem is that people make a false idol out of gathering information, and it doesn't lead anywhere. It's a trick, a carrot, and a stick. That's why what's really important isn't what you know, but what you do with what you know. What really matters in terms of quickening your spiritual development is the phase of application. At some point, the serious spiritual student and teacher will have to take everything he or she has learned and actually apply it to every person, situation, or event that comes up in front of their face on any given day. That applies to everything. And usually it's not a mystery. Whatever is happening in your life, that's the lesson that the Holy Spirit wants you to apply the teachings to, and the Holy Spirit's great instrument of salvation is forgiveness. But as you know, this isn't the old-fashioned kind of forgiveness. This is not your parents' spirituality. This is a whole new ball game, a new paradigm. It's only through disciplined application that the practitioner can enter the glorious phase of experience. And I guarantee you, dear brother, that experience is the only thing that will ever make you happy. Words will never do it, intellectual concepts, theology, philosophical speculation, forget it. A Course in Miracles, which as you know, is J, our English symbol for Yeshua, speaking the word of God, says that words are but symbols of symbols, twice removed from reality. And when you think about it, how is a symbol of a symbol ever going to make you happy? No. The only thing that will make you happy is the experience of what you really are. What will truly satisfy you is not a symbol of reality, but an experience of reality. At one point in that same course, Jay is talking about all the difficult questions people have, and he makes the remarkable statement, there is no answer, only an experience. Seek only this, and do not let theology delay you. That experience comes as a result of allowing your mind to be trained by the Holy Spirit to think and see others as he does. But it takes a good system, like Buddhism, or a course in miracles, to be hastened on the road to accomplishment. Left to its own devices, the mind cannot be healed. As Jay also says in his course, an untrained mind can accomplish nothing. That's quite a statement because it's saying that 99.9% .9 of all the people on the earth are accomplishing nothing. Until the mind is trained, you're just spinning your wheels. Gary, yeah. I've realized more and more how important the workbook of the course is in that regard, and I think I've also realized that no matter what comes up, it's all for the same purpose, which is forgiveness. I'm not saying I always do it right away. I don't. But I always do it eventually. And the sooner I do it, the less I suffer. Take speaking in public, for example, which I never thought I'd do. I was really nervous about it, but by letting the Holy Spirit help me, I started to realize that I wasn't nervous for the reason I thought. It's like the Course says, I am never upset for the reason I think. 
Arden, that's right, hotshot. Everybody's afraid of something in this world, and as difficult as it may be for people to believe, because it's unconscious to them, all fears that people have can be directly traced at the level of the unconscious mind to the fear of God that is a result of your seeming separation from him and the unconscious guilt that resulted from it. Gary, hey! Does this mean we're gonna do another book? Because if we are, there are people who might not understand what you just said. Arden, well, why don't you give us a little review, then? Tell us the teachings in a nutshell so both the uninitiated and the experienced practitioner will have a better idea what we're talking about. You can do it. Things are going pretty good for your speaking, as well as for the disappearance of the universe, so far, right? Gary, yes, everything's under control. Mistakes have been made, but others have been blamed. Just kidding. But I don't know if I should go any further with this speaking thing. I mean, I did what I wanted to do. I went right out there, even in Manhattan, and said that this is my experience. The book is just the way it happened. People can believe it or not, but if they don't, at least it won't be because I didn't tell them. Persa, I'm afraid your forgiveness lessons are just beginning. What if I told you that starting at the end of February, you'll start flying over 100,000 miles a year to teach spirituality? Gary, I'd say you're kidding, right? Arden, that's what will be the most helpful, brother. Including yourself, you could count on two fingers the number of people who are out there on the road accurately teaching this message. But don't think that's what it's really about. At the same time you're traveling and speaking, we want you to do your real job, which is forgiveness. Not the old-fashioned kind, but the new kind. Persa, are you willing to undergo drastic changes in your personal lifestyle, knowing that no matter how things look, it's really just a trick to convince you you're a body, and then forgive it? Gary, ah, uh, no. Arden, well... We know better. So get your affairs in order, buddy. You've got quite a ride coming up. Now how about that review we talked about? Gary, what about those who already know this stuff? Won't it seem repetitious? Persa, don't forget something we told you the first time around. Repetition isn't just all right, it's mandatory. You can't hear right-minded ideas too much. It takes time for them to sink into the deep canyons of your unconscious mind. We've already said that it's not how much spiritual information you put into the mind that determines how enlightened you are, and that's true. However, at the same time, the background provided by knowing the metaphysics of a teaching like A Course in Miracles can help you to make the decision to apply what you know which is the most important part of the application. Once you understand the truth, then remembering it when the stuff hits the fan is the hard part. If and when you get into the habit of remembering the truth in difficult situations, it becomes almost second nature for you to apply it. When that time comes, you'll be progressing light years toward the experience we've been speaking about. As the Course puts it, it is this experience toward which the course is directed. Gary, all right. Can I tell you a joke first? I like to tell jokes in my workshops. Arden, you went to Manhattan last month. Tell us that New York joke you like. Gary, no problem. This Buddhist is walking in Central Park. He walks up to a hot dog vendor and says, make me one with everything. The vendor gives the Buddhist a hot dog, and after the Buddhist pays for it, he asks for his change. But the hot dog vendor says, change comes from within. Persa, yes, you get a nice laugh with that one. We like that you have a good sense of humor in your presentations. It's important to remember to laugh. Remember what Jay says in the text, into eternity, 
where all is one, there crept a tiny, mad idea, at which the Son of God remembered not to laugh. Gary, and of course that tiny mad idea is the thought that we could have an individual identity and be separate from God. So, as for that review you asked for, the Course is a three books in one spiritual document that includes a text, which gives the entire theory, then there's a workbook for students, which is a one-year program that often takes people longer than one year to do and which trains the student to apply the course to everyday life, plus there's a manual for teachers, which reinforces the whole thing. The course was given by Jay over a period of seven years to a research psychiatrist in New York City named Helen Skookman. She would write down in her shorthand notebook what Jay said and then say it to her colleague, Bill Thetford, who typed it out. When you guys appeared to me, you gave me, through your teachings, a different vision of Jay 2000 years ago, whose real name was Yeshua, a Jewish rabbi who never intended to start a religion. Since then I've had some memories of my own. I found that when you talked to me about some of my past lifetimes, it would trigger more memories of those lifetimes in the following weeks and months. For example, you told me that a thousand years ago I was a friend and student of the enlightened American Indian teacher known as the Great Sunday. That brought up feelings, memories, and visions of that lifetime as an Indian in Cahokia. Note, the Cahokia site is located in Collinsville, Illinois and represents the most sophisticated prehistoric Native American society north of Mexico. I even remembered that I should put the emphasis on the third syllable when I say Cahokia, instead of on the second, which is the way white people say it. Arden, that's right. We had pronounced it the modern way, because we're speaking to you in English, but you just pronounced it the way an Indian from a thousand years ago would say it. Gary, and when you told me who I was two thousand years ago with Jay, that also triggered more memories of that lifetime. Persa, how did it make you feel to find out you were St. Thomas at the time of J, and I'm you? Gary, I know you know the answer to that, and you're just asking rhetorical questions. You know everything. And I still can't believe you're here. But when I found out who I was at the time of J, it felt really great for about two days. I mean, it was really cool. But then after a while, you get up and you realize you have the same old crap right in front of your face. The forgiveness lessons are right there, and it doesn't matter who you were in another lifetime. You always have to choose to forgive whatever's happening right now. Persa, very good, dear brother. Everyone's been enormously famous and seemingly important in some lifetimes and all have been the dregs of the earth in others. That's duality. What matters is doing your forgiveness work right now. That's the way out. But it's not the old-fashioned kind of forgiveness at all. Would you care to explain why? Gary, I'll do my best. First of all, as a rabbi and a mystic, Jay understood well the teachings of ancient Jewish mysticism, among those would be the idea that heaven is closeness to God, and hell is distance from God. But Jay, being an uncompromising kind of a guy, didn't stop there. For him, heaven wouldn't just be closeness to God, it would be oneness with God. In fact, it would be perfect oneness with God. And hell wouldn't just be distance from God, it would be anything that is separate from God. That narrows it down to two distinct choices, and only one of them is real, because perfect oneness cannot have a counterpart, or else it wouldn't be perfect. So to Jay, God is changeless, perfect, and eternal. And God is synonymous with spirit, because nothing he makes would be any different from him, or else it wouldn't be perfect. And besides, if God could make anything that wasn't perfect, then he himself wouldn't be perfect either, would he? And spirit doesn't have to evolve, or else it wouldn't be perfect. Heaven wouldn't just be closeness to God, it would be oneness with God. In fact, 
it would be perfect oneness with God. Of course, God is not a he or a she, and I'm using biblical language like the course. I could call God in it, but that wouldn't exactly turn anybody on either. So right off the bat we notice a couple of things about our friend Jay. First, he's uncompromising. Second, no matter how complicated things may appear to be, there are always only two things to choose from, and only one of them is real. The other choice would be an illusion, which was taught by the Hindus and Buddhists long before Jay, but he elevated the alternative to a flawless version of a god who really is perfect love, rather than a god who is conflicted and imperfect. Next, you have to remember that Jay was from the Middle East. He would have had more of an Eastern slant than a Western one. So he certainly was familiar with the teachings of Buddhism. He would know about the Buddhist concept of ego. He would understand and experience that there is only one ego appearing as many, in what the Hindus call the world of multiplicity and the Buddhists call impermanence. So there's only one of us that thinks that it's here, and I'm it. There isn't really anybody else. There's nobody out there. It only looks that way. It's a trick. The conscious part of the mind looks out and sees all kinds of separation, different bodies, and forms, but that's an illusion. And the unconscious part of the mind, almost all of which is hidden, just the way most of an iceberg is hidden underneath the surface of the water, knows that there's really only one of us. Time and space and differences turn out to all be untrue, despite appearances. The reason everything is connected is because there's only one illusion, just like there's only one God. But God has nothing to do with the illusion. That was a false assumption on the part of people. People then made up a God in their image, who was like what they believed themselves to be. But God made us originally in his image, perfect, innocent, and one. The oneness that exists in the illusion is an imitation oneness because the ego attempts to mimic God. Today, quantum physicists are confirming that time and space are just illusions, also. Past, present, and future all occur simultaneously. We are actually non-local beings having a local experience. It may look like you're over there and I'm over here, but it's a lie. Space is just a separation idea, as is time. We divided up time and space to make it look like different intervals of time and different places, when it's really all made up and everything's the same, even though it looks different, because it's all an illusion that's based on the thought of separation. Except the physicists don't know that part yet. They just know that our experience is an illusion compared to the way things really are when you look closer. They don't have the whole picture yet, just part of it. Science and spirituality haven't completely met yet, but they're getting there. For example, they know that if I look at a star that's 20 billion light years away, I cause it to change instantaneously at the subatomic level. How is that possible? It's because the star isn't really 20 billion light years away, it's really in my mind. Or more accurately, it's a projection of my mind. I made it up, and it's coming from me, not at me, like most people think. And it's not even matter until I look at it or touch it. It's energy, which is really thought, which is why energy can't be destroyed. And matter is just a different form of energy, returning to energy and then recycling. Persa, and how did J, 2000 years ago, use all of that Buddhist and Jewish mystical knowledge? which matched the findings of today's physicists. Gary, well, he figured out something that people still don't understand, even today with all these advances in knowledge, including psychology, and it's this, if there's really only one of us here, and if the unconscious part of the mind knows that, then what are we doing when we go around judging and condemning other people? All we're really doing is sending a message directly into our own unconscious mind that we are worthy of being judged and condemned. 
Whatever we think about others is really like sending a message about ourselves to ourself. So Jay decided that if there's really only one of us who thinks it's here, and if the unconscious mind knows that, then he was going to go through life seeing everyone as being what they really are, which is perfect spirit, instead of seeing them as bodies, which is really just a false idea of separation. He would see everyone as being Christ, pure and innocent. He would think of them as being what they really are, immortal, invulnerable, and something that cannot even be touched by this world. Thus, the key to enlightenment lies in a secret that very few people have ever known, but which Jay knew well. The way you will experience and feel about yourself is not determined by how other people look at and think about you. The way that you will experience and feel about yourself is actually determined by how you look at and think about them. Ultimately, this determines your identity. You will identify yourself either as a body or as perfect spirit, as either divided or whole, depending on how you see others. And once you understand that, I would think you'd want to get pretty damn careful how you think about other people. Persa, you honor us as teachers. And of course you know who our teacher was. Please continue. Gary, what? Do you want me to do all the talking? Persa, we'll have plenty to say, including contributing to this review. Gary, I should hope so. By the way, I've been thinking, because of the way our talks went before, I had a lot of personal stuff in the last book. I don't mind talking about my personal forgiveness lessons but a couple of the people I mentioned weren't too thrilled by the fact that I portrayed myself in my narration as forgiving them. There are two sides to every story. That's duality, right? Yet all I can do is present my experience. Can you give me any advice on how to talk about personal stuff? Persa, don't worry, Gary. Because of the direction your life is taking right now, we're going to be discussing your professional forgiveness lessons more than your personal ones. It will all work out. Trust us. Would you like to continue with our review? Gary, you asked for it, but I must say, you look more beautiful than ever. Tell me something, just between you and me. Would it be incest to make love to your future self? Persa, no, but it would be weird. Please proceed. Gary, okay, I can take a hint for now. To continue, every time Jay forgave, he was actually rejoining with himself. Arden, do you get the larger meaning of that? Gary, I get it. He was actually going from an experience of separation to wholeness. And the word holy actually comes from the word whole. As he said in the Gospel of Thomas, I am the one who comes from what is whole, I was given from the things of my Father. Therefore, I say to you that if one is whole one will be filled with light, but if one is divided, then one will be filled with darkness. So you can't have it both ways. You can't be a little bit whole. Your allegiance must be undivided, or else you're divided. No matter how complicated things seem to get, there are always really just two choices. One is for wholeness, or holiness, which is one and perfect. That's why the old prayer said, The Lord our God is one. The other choice is for anything that isn't perfect oneness, which is division. There's no getting away from that. So Jay completely forgave the world. His love and forgiveness were total and all-encompassing. He knew that if you partially forgive the world, then you will be partially forgiven, which is to remain divided. But if you completely forgive the world, then you will be completely forgiven. Thus, the great teaching of Jay and the Holy Spirit is for forgiveness, but in a quantum sense, rather than the old-fashioned, Newtonian, subject and object kind of forgiveness. The old-fashioned kind of forgiveness is saying, all right, I'm forgiving you, because I'm better than you are, and you really did it, and you're really guilty, 
but I'm going to let you off the hook, except you're still going to hell. All that does is keep the strange separation beliefs that we really have about ourselves recycling in our own unconscious mind. It's not really forgiveness. Jay, on the other hand, knew about a deep, unconscious guilt that's in everybody's mind over the original, seeming separation from God, and that there's a different kind of forgiveness that's the fastest way to undo it, which is the equivalent of undoing the ego. Arden, we'll have to explain that a little more at some point, perhaps with a quick version of the miscreation story, in order to point out where that guilt came from. After all, you can't break the cycle of birth and death and stop appearing to reincarnate as long as that unconscious guilt remains in the mind. Gary, sure, but do me a favor. Tell me more about the idea of all this being a dream. In the few appearances I've done, I've gotten a lot of questions about that. And I still can't believe that you are here. Persa, none of us are here, Gary, as you know. So let's talk about the dream. Say you're a parent, and you have a four-year-old daughter who's in bed at night, and she's dreaming. You peek in on her to see how she is, and you can tell that she's dreaming, she's tossing and turning a little, and you can see she's uncomfortable. For her, the dream has become her reality. She reacts to the figures in the dream as though they're real. Now, you can't see the dream. Why? Because it's not really there, and your four-year-old has never really left her bed. She's still safe at home, but she can't see it. It's out of her awareness, and the dream has become her reality. You want to wake her up so she won't be afraid anymore. So what do you do? Do you go over and shake the hell out of her? No, because that would scare her even more. So you wake her up quietly and gently. Perhaps you whisper things to her like, Hey, it's only a dream. You don't have to worry. What you're seeing is not true. And all the problems, all the worries, all the fears and the pains you feel are really just kind of silly, because there's no need for them, and they're taking place inside of a dream that doesn't really exist. They're the product of the same silly ideas that produced the dream in the first place. And if you can hear my voice right now, you're already starting to wake up. That's because the truth can be heard in the dream. Remember, the truth is not in the dream, but it can be heard in the dream. Your four-year-old hears you and starts to relax. She wakens slowly and gently. Her dream becomes happier. And then when she finally wakes up, she sees that she never really left the bed. She was actually home all the while. Home was still there, but it was out of her awareness. As awareness returns, she wakes up, and the fact that she is safe at home becomes her reality. You knew she was there all the time. There was no need to see her dream or to react to it. And where is the dream when she wakes up from it? Gary, nowhere. It disappears because it was never really there anyway. It may have looked real and felt real, but it wasn't really there. The images we see in our dreams at night are projections. We're seeing them with one part of our mind, and they're actually being projected by another part of our mind, but that part is hidden. Persa, very nice. As you said, it's a trick. And here's the fun part. When the four-year-old wakes up from the dream, it's just another dream. And when you woke up this morning in your bed, it was just another form of dreaming. It's a function of levels, which don't exist in the reality of pure spirit. In fact, you could say that the reason this dream feels more convincing than your nocturnal dreams is to convince you of its reality. And convincing it is but it's not really there. And the people who you think are out there aren't really there either. Yet for you, the dream has become your reality, and where you really are is out of your awareness. As A Course in Miracles puts it, all your time is spent in dreaming. 
Your sleeping and your waking dreams have different forms, and that's all. Their content is the same. The Holy Spirit is whispering the same kinds of things to you right now in this dream that you would whisper to a four-year-old in bed at night. He's saying things like, Hey, it's only a dream. You don't have to worry. What you're seeing isn't true. And all the problems, all the worries, all the fears and pains you feel are really just kind of silly, because there's no need for them, plus they're taking place inside of a dream that doesn't really exist. They're the product of the same silly ideas that produced the dream in the first place. And if you can hear my voice right now, you're already starting to wake up, because the truth can be heard in the dream. The truth is not in the dream, but it can be heard in the dream. And when you start to know the truth, which will be communicated to you by the Holy Spirit in many different ways, you start to relax. You awaken slowly and gently through a cocoon process called forgiveness. Just as the caterpillar goes through a cocoon process to be prepared for a higher and less restricted form of life, you become prepared for a higher form of life by changing your perception of the world. As a result of this, your dream becomes happier. But that happiness is not dependent on what appears to happen in the dream. It's an inner peace that can be there for you regardless of what appears to be happening in the dream. And then, when you finally wake up, you see that you never really left home, which is your perfect oneness with God. You were actually home all the while. Home was still here, but it was out of your awareness. As Jay put it in the Gospel of Thomas, the kingdom of the Father is spread out upon the earth, and people do not see it. As awareness returns, you wake up to the reality of the kingdom, and you have the knowledge that you are always safe at home. Gary, but if all that's true, then it means that God doesn't even know I'm here. Arden, you're completely missing the point. The point is you're not here, and God knows where you really are. And instead of diving in and making an unreal dream real, God has a better idea. He wants you to wake up and be with Him. Eventually you wake up to heaven, where God knew you always were. There was no need for God to see your dream or to react to it. As A Course in Miracles says, you are at home in God, dreaming of exile but perfectly capable of awakening to reality. And tell me, Gary, where is a dream of time and space when you wake up from it? Gary, nowhere. It disappears, because like any dream, it's a mirage that vanishes, a spell that is dispelled. And now reality becomes my reality. Arden, yes. So when you awaken from the dream of time and space, there is no more time and space, which means that you don't have to hang around for a million years waiting for everyone to wake up. There is nobody else to wake up. There was nobody out there but you, the one ego, appearing as many. And the ones you thought were out there are already with you in heaven, not as bodies, but as what they really are, which is spirit. Nobody can be left out in oneness, and nothing can be lacking in wholeness. So everyone you ever loved or cared about, including animals, are there in your awareness. Once again, not as anything that was ever separate, but as something that can never be separate. Nothing can be missing in perfection. It's all perfectly one, and it's constant, which is an attribute that doesn't exist in the universe of time and space. However, it can be experienced by you, even though you may appear to be in a body. When you awaken from the dream of time and space, there is no more time and space. Gary, I've had that experience. Persa, we know, and we can talk more about it later, because it is the answer to all questions. Despite your demeanor, we know that you can never fully believe in the ego again. And once you have that experience, then it becomes easier to build your house upon the rock instead of on the sand. The sand represents the shifting sands of time and space, 
where nothing can really be depended on except the fact that it's going to change, because this is a world of time and change. So the only thing you know for sure is that it won't be the same one minute from now. But the rock is permanent, it's something that can be depended on. Gary, yeah. Once you experience reality, even if it's brief, then everything in this world is just kind of like chicken crap compared to what's available. Arden, yes, and you're doing well remembering to make the right choice between the two. You're not perfect, but you're doing good, and we're pleased. Gary, thanks. Hey. Can I use some of this stuff in my workshops? Arden, you use the first book in your workshops, don't you? Gary, I'll take that as a yes. So, what seems to go on here in the world? May look and feel real, but it isn't. The images I see in my dreams at night are projections. I'm seeing them with one part of my mind, and they're actually being projected by another part of my mind, but that part is hidden. And during the day all I'm seeing with the body's eyes is a projection from my own unconscious mind of something that I secretly believe to be true about myself. Just like Freud said that everyone in your dreams is really you, it turns out that everyone in our life is also a symbol of us. Jay knew that, and being a pretty smart guy he realized that all people do by judging and condemning others is keep their own false ego identity in place as a result, but if they forgive, in the true sense of the word, then they undo the false ego identity and return to spirit. Arden, yes, and it's interesting that Freud didn't actually use the word ego. He used the word itch, which means I, and which indicates a personal identity. You could combine that with the all-encompassing Buddhist term ego, and what you have is one being that incorrectly thinks it has an identity that is separate from its source. Persa and I'm glad you're talking about undoing the ego. It's definitely not enough to just tell people the world isn't real. That won't get them anywhere. It's true that knowing that the world is an illusion is a necessary part of the picture. But it's only true forgiveness, which we'll talk a lot more about eventually, that undoes the ego. Without it, little progress is made. It's all about how you think. If you think the person you're seeing is a body, then you're a body. If you think the person you're seeing is spirit, then you're spirit. That's how it will be translated by your own unconscious mind. There's no getting away from that. The way you think of the other person determines how you will ultimately feel about yourself. We'll do a little more of the review with you later. Gary. It's funny how a spiritual document like the Course can use Christian terminology but incorporate so many Buddhists ideas into it. Maybe that's why some Christians are reluctant to embrace it. Arden, yes. Conservative Christians don't recognize the Course. Gary, that's okay. They also don't recognize each other at Hooters. Persa, cute. And just so people will recognize us, we want to make it clear that we only appear to you and will never appear to anyone else or give channeled information to anyone else. Gary, I'm not complaining, but why? Persa, it's simple. Helen Skookman took seven years to scribe a course in miracles. Before that, almost all channelers were trans channelers. Whether it was the psychic Edgar Casey or Jane Roberts, who channeled Seth, people who received information from a higher source did not hear it themselves, but needed a device to be able to get out of the way and let the information come through them. As A Course in Miracles itself says, only very few can hear God's voice at all but then, after the Course came out, and people heard that this woman was simply hearing the voice of Jesus, who was the manifestation of the Holy Spirit, then all of a sudden everyone was hearing the voice of Jay or the Holy Spirit, even though you had the Course saying that they couldn't. The reason is obvious. If people could hear the Holy Spirit's voice, then they didn't really have to understand the Course or do the forgiveness work it asked of them, 
did they? They didn't have to look at the ego or their unconscious guilt, or do anything about it. Rather than accepting the challenge to come up to a whole new level that Jay was offering them, through the same kind of forgiveness work he had done, they could simply make up their own course to their own liking. So right away you had people acting as teachers of the course who couldn't possibly have taken the time to learn it and do the work, and before you knew it, you had people reporting that Jay was saying things to them that actually contradicted things he said in A Course in Miracles. We don't want people doing the same thing with our words. So here's a disclaimer. If anyone ever says Artan or Persa are appearing to them or speaking to them and giving them information, now or in the future, then they're mistaken. It's not us. We will never do that. That way, no one can ever contradict our words in our names or compromise what we're saying. We'll leave the flawed reporting of J.S. and the Holy Spirit's teachings to those who claim to be inspired by the Course without ever really having learned it. Gary, that's a pretty provocative statement, and some may take it to be a little harsh. After all, they can't get your loving attitude without seeing you. Persa, sorry, Gary, but someone has to point out these things. It takes many years of practice to make significant progress, but a lot of people want to skip to the end without utilizing the means, which is forgiveness. They want to be a master without being a student. That's why we're pleased that you present yourself as just a student who shares your experiences and passes the teachings along. If you try to be more than that, then strange things happen. For example, there are a couple of so-called course teachers who have set themselves up as cult leaders. Sometimes it's obvious that this is what's going on, and sometimes it's more subtle. In any case, if a teacher or their assistants try to get you to surrender any personal property to them or make large donations, something is rotten in Denmark. Ditto if they want you to live at their location. It's clear that the course is not meant to be used as an escape from society, but as a tool to forgive society. Invariably, cult leaders will present a facade of being infallible. Rather than empowering you to do your own forgiveness work, which is clearly the intention of the Course, they'll try to make you think that it's being in their presence and following them that leads to enlightenment. In fact, you'll get to experience one of them in person within a few months. Don't react to him. Forgive instead, and know that he's a fine example of what happens when you don't feel the need to learn and practice the Course and decide to use people instead all the time masquerading as a master. Note, the kind of teachers Persa is referring to above would not include those affiliated with Pathways of Light in Kiel, Wisconsin, run by Reverends Robert and Mary Stolting, which is a fine teaching organization. Gary, none of that is new in the world, but why do these cult leaders have to say they're teaching the Course? Why don't they just use the Bible or something? Persa, Sometimes they do use the Bible, and other things, and mix them with the Course, which you also shouldn't do, unless you're being absolutely true to the message of the Course and are using the other things either for contrast or as supporting tools. Gary, is it possible to both teach and practice the Course? Arden, possible? Yes. Difficult? Absolutely. The only way to do it is to always remember what everything is for, which is forgiveness. You, dear brother, don't always remember that right away, but you do eventually. Your forgiveness isn't perfect, but it is persistent. And as long as you do it, you will make good progress. The time you delay forgiveness simply contributes to your own suffering. Gary. So the kind of forgiveness you're talking about should also be applied to the cult leaders you were just discussing. Arden, yes, and as we said, you'll have a chance to forgive one of them in person, just as you'll have many new experiences to forgive in the next couple of years. Gary, great. Just what I need more forgiveness opportunities. Arden, remember, 
that's what will get you home the fastest. Gary, what about meditation? Persa, the best form of meditation is the kind we taught you before, at the end of the chapter called True Prayer in Abundance. That kind of meditation actually reflects the original form of prayer, which was silent and really about joining with God. By putting God first, and acknowledging Him as your one true source, it not only helps to undo the separation in your mind, but can also result in the after-effect of inspiration. I'm glad you still do that meditation five minutes in the morning and five minutes at night. That's really all you need. There is no better way to be inspired. You simply get lost in God's love, feel gratitude toward Him, and imagine yourself as being perfectly one with Him. Remember something, though, there is no substitute for practicing forgiveness, and that's the spiritual life in the fast lane that our brother Jay was teaching by both word and example 2000 years ago. Gary, what about being in the now? Arden, where the practice of be here now will get you is here. Sure, it will relax you, but it won't get you home. One aspect of that kind of a system is to watch your judgments. But watching your judgments is not forgiving them. And the now that is experienced is not the eternal always of heaven, which can only be consistently experienced when the ego has been completely undone by the Holy Spirit. That requires that you do your part to forgive, and the Holy Spirit takes care of the part of the job you can't see, deep within your unconscious mind. Then as you go along, you'll have experiences that tell you you're on the right track. Sometimes it will simply be a feeling of deep inner peace. That's a lot more important than you realize. If peace is the condition of the kingdom, then your mind must be returned to a condition of peace before it can re-enter the kingdom. Otherwise it wouldn't fit in. It would be like trying to fit a square block into a round hole. The peace of God which passeth understanding is a prerequisite to going home. Once again, it's not achieved on a permanent basis until all unconscious guilt has been removed from the mind by the Holy Spirit. And remember what we said about teaching, there's nothing wrong with repetition. In fact, it's essential. Gary, you already said that. Arden, funny. Yet you've no doubt had the experience of reading a paragraph in the course that you know you've read before, but it's like you're seeing it for the first time. This also happens when people reread the disappearance of the universe. They know they've seen the words before, but they're getting it on a completely different level. The words haven't changed, but they have. The ego has been undone a little bit more, and now they're seeing the words from a different place. Repetition is important not just in learning these ideas, but in practicing forgiveness. Sometimes it may look like you are forgiving the same thing over and over again. You forgive the people you work with. Then you go back the next day, and they're still there. But even if it looks like you are forgiving the same thing, that's an illusion, too. What's really happening is that more unconscious guilt is coming to the surface of your mind and it's a chance for you to release and be rid of it by continuing to forgive. Persa, we're going to take our leave shortly, but we'll be back in two months. When we return, we'll talk about power. Real power. What it is and how to use it. That will eventually lead to a deeper practice of forgiveness, which will show you how to end reincarnation by using the very things that come up in front of your face in the world where you appear to live and work. Gary, I don't work here. I'm a consultant. Arden, you still want to break the cycle of birth and death, don't you? Gary, sure, but you told me last time that I'm coming back for one more lifetime, so what's the deal? If I'm going to learn how to end reincarnation, then why do I have to come back again? Arden, don't ever forget, Gary, the Holy Spirit can see everything, and you can only see part of it. The Course teaches that the Holy Spirit recognized all that time holds, 
and gave it to all minds that each one might determine, from a point where time was ended, when it is released to revelation and eternity. Did you ever stop to think that your coming back one more time might be a big help to others? You really only have one big forgiveness lesson to learn in that lifetime. By practicing forgiveness on the little things, as well as that one big thing, you'll serve as an example to others. As Persa, you'll also be a tremendous help to me. Usually your final lifetime is not just a great lifetime for you personally, it's one where you perform a tremendous service for others, maybe publicly, but often not. It all fits together, like the hologram that it is. In order for all minds to determine when they're released, each must do their part to bring about the interlocking chain of forgiveness which, when completed, is the atonement. So play your part, brother, and be grateful. You have fascinating times ahead of you. So do many others. Remember we said that there are more people today than ever on this planet who either are enlightened or will be this time around. You're helping people to get that way by sharing the teachings. Some of them won't have to come back again, partly because of you. There's no better vocation than to share the truth with others and forgive as you go along. Persa, two months from now you are going to be hitting the road for the first time, flying all over the country and spreading the message. You will be a little nervous and tentative at first, but that will pass if you use it for forgiveness. That's what it's for. Practice and you will be fine. We'll be back with more just after you return from your first cross-country trip. Gary, wow! That's exciting. I haven't been to that many places, you know. Arden, just remember that it's all a dream, and just how happy a dream it is will depend on your forgiveness. Arden and Persa then disappeared instantaneously, but I felt a deep satisfaction that my friends were in my life again. I had become a little overwhelmed by all that had happened in the previous year, and it felt good to have some coaching. I had no idea at the time of the deep extent to which I would be challenged by both them and my life in the next two years. Real Power The power of decision is your one remaining freedom as a prisoner of this world. You can decide to see it right. During the next two months, I often thought about what Persa had said about experience. The previous year had not lacked forgiveness lessons as related to the publication of the book. The unseemly viciousness of a small minority of supposedly spiritual students on the internet had come as a great surprise to me. Some of them maligned the book without ever having read it because they had some kind of a political axe to grind. I wouldn't have believed such people even existed within the so-called A Course in Miracles community. Having been initiated into this community, I quickly started to think of it as a family that needed to practice the very course it claimed to believe in. Fortunately for me, through my travels, I was about to get to meet the real course community in person, and understand that unlike what I was sometimes seeing on the internet, the overwhelming majority of these people were really interested in making the kind of amazing spiritual progress the Course was offering them. At the same time, there was an online discussion group about the disappearance of the universe, which, as mentioned previously, the members immediately started referring to as D.U., that was starting to grow. After a rough start because of some visitors who wanted to try to attack the book and me, the forum was turning into one of the most loving and supportive groups on the internet. I did the best I could to practice forgiveness, knowing that the habit of application would result in spiritual experience. Success didn't always fit my pictures. Even with the book starting to do very well, there always seemed to be obstacles to overcome. This included attacks, which were sometimes subtle and sometimes outrageous. When things didn't appear to be going my way, I did the best I could to practice forgiveness, knowing that the habit of application would result in spiritual experience, whether in the form of inner peace or in the kind of unpredictable mystical experiences I had grown accustomed to. 
The course taught me that I couldn't really be attacked on the level of my mind, although it could certainly appear that someone was attacking me. Still, at times the practice was very difficult, and I would delay my decision to choose the Holy Spirit as my teacher instead of the ego. This made me wonder why I couldn't always live the course directive I was so fond of, which says, love holds no grievances. Why was it possible to forgive some people and so difficult to forgive others? I knew that the Course also taught, as you see him you will see yourself. Whatever way I looked at and thought about another person would surely create how I experienced myself and ultimately determine my own identity as either spirit or a body. I wanted to know why it was sometimes so hard to make the right choice. Arden and Persa said I was going to be traveling a lot. It was increasingly obvious that writing and speaking, and my forgiveness of what I had to do in connection with them, was going to be my work. Only six months before, I had never spoken in public. But now, after just a handful of talks and workshops, I was about to hit the road and engage regularly in a new vocation. I couldn't help but think back to October of 1992 two months before my friends had first appeared to me. Things weren't going well for me financially, and I strongly considered going back to playing my guitar, which I had done for 20 years, in order to bring in some money. I took my Les Paul custom out of the closet, stood in my living room with it on my shoulder, and started to practice. Both of my hands and arms were occupied playing the instrument. Suddenly, and to my astonishment, I felt another hand pushing the end of the neck of the guitar slowly but steadily toward the ground, and me along with it. It was as if an invisible entity was stopping me from playing, interfering in a firm but gentle way, and giving me a message I couldn't escape, no, this isn't what you're supposed to do anymore. I got the message. I didn't know yet exactly what I was supposed to do, but after this experience, I had a feeling it would show up. Two months later I saw Artin and Persa for the first time, and eventually found out that I was being given a chance to dedicate the rest of my life to nothing less than a way to return home to God. On my very first trip to California, at the end of February, I went to see Mel Gibson's just released movie, The Passion of the Christ. I was taken aback by the suffering brooding depiction of Jay and the horrific violence of the film. I looked forward to talking with my ascended visitors about it. I didn't have to wait long. Two months after their previous appearance, while sitting in my living room, Arden and Persa were there with me once again. As always, their appearance was instantaneous, as if I were watching a television channel and then flicked the remote control causing the picture to change instantly. My friends' entries and exits were very similar. It was as if they were changing frequencies or even dimensions, although I certainly didn't want to limit them. Arden, you have a lot on your mind, hotshot. Where would you like to begin? Gary, as I'm sure you know, I went to see Mel Gibson's movie, The Passion of the Christ. I'd like to talk a little bit about it. Arden, maybe a little, brother, but I think today would be best served by discussing other things. Gary, really? You usually talk about what I want to talk about. Persa, there's a subject we want to cover later that can best incorporate Mel's take on the crucifixion, but you did notice the little trick we played on you regarding the movie, didn't you? Note. Persa had told me during the first series of visits that if I wanted to see Christianity in a nutshell, all I had to do was go back to the old scripture, they never called it the Old Testament, and read the book of Isaiah, chapter 53, verses 5 through 10. Their statement was published a year before Passion was released. That part of the Bible talks about a lamb being led to the slaughter, and says, by his wounds we are healed. It's the old idea that somehow you can atone for other people's sins through the sacrifice of an innocent. The problem is that it was written 700 years before J, 
and had nothing to do with him. It was about another prophet. Later, people would try to make a prophecy out of it and apply it to Che, but it wasn't about him at all. They then took this belief, although it had nothing to do with what Che was teaching, and superimposed it onto him, assuming that like them, he believed in a thought system of sin, guilt, fear, suffering, sacrifice, and death. The trick Persa is referring to is that they told me to read that section, Isaiah, chapter 53, verses 5 through 10, knowing that the statement would be published before the movie came out. Then when I went to see The Passion of the Christ, the very first thing that Mel Gibson put up on the screen was a quotation. It was from the book of Isaiah, chapter 53, verses 5 through 10. What follows is a sample of those verses from the Bible, from which Mel also used an excerpt. It displays a thought system that was already in the unconscious mind, and was being expressed through the writer. But he was wounded for our transgressions, he was bruised for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that made us whole, and by his wounds we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray, we have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed, and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. Like a lamb that is led to the slaughter, and like a sheep that before its shearers is dumb. So he opened not his mouth. And they made his grave with the wicked and with a rich man in his death. Although he had done no violence, and there was no deceit in his mouth. Yet it was the will of the Lord to wound him, he has put him to grief. When he makes himself an offering for sin. Many centuries later, Saul of Tarsus, better known as the Apostle Paul, who was in deep guilt over his killing of numerous Christians, had a conflicted, part ego, experience on the road to Damascus that caused him to take up what he thought was the cause of Jesus. Being a Jewish man who believed in the old scripture, it was not surprising or difficult for Paul to incorporate the beliefs from the above verses into his developing theology about J. This led to a religion that lost most of J.S. true message and substituted it with a thought system of their own. My experience with passion wasn't the first time my teachers had told me something while being aware that I would later see or hear it at the movies, which they knew was my favorite hobby. They had pulled a similar thing on me by saying, people are like ghosts, except on a seemingly different level. They think their bodies are alive, but they're not. They just see what they want to see. A couple of years later, I saw the excellent film, The Sixth Sense, written and directed by M. Night Shyamalan. When the boy in the movie decided that it was time to tell the psychologist his secret, two of the lines he said about the ghosts he was seeing were, they think they're alive. They just see what they want to see. I almost came up out of my chair when I heard those lines during this somewhat scary and very fascinating film, knowing that my friends had gotten me. But I also knew that they were doing more than just playing a joke. They had managed to bring the point home to me even more. Arden, yes, we were watching you at the beginning of the movie to see your reaction. Gary, you mean the quotation at the beginning, by his wounds we are healed. I guess if we're healed by them, then that would explain why Mel showed so many of them. Arden, that's the ego thought system, brother. We'll talk more about that in the movie later. There's a section in A Course in Miracles called The Hero of the Dream. When we get into that, we'll also discuss passion and how the world's beliefs are so heavily rooted in the body. Persa, and speaking of bodies, you know that love holds no grievances idea you've pondered so much can be thought of as the antidote to the body. As that lesson in the Course says, to hold a grievance is to forget who you are. To hold a grievance is to see yourself as a body. You've been having a tough time with certain forgiveness lessons lately. Gary, you know it. Why is it that some people seem so easy to forgive, and some so hard? Persa. 
you've got to remember that the unconscious mind knows everything. It knows every relationship you've ever had, in any lifetime. You should also consider that the lifetimes you appear to go through are like a dance in which you play the role of victim in one lifetime and victimizer in the next. So a murderer in this lifetime gets murdered in the next one, sometimes by the same person whom they killed in the other lifetime. That's true with actions as well as occupations. A minister in this lifetime may be a prostitute in the next, and vice versa. In fact, the prostitute Jay saved from being stoned to death, who was not Mary Magdalene, had helped Jay in a lifetime previous to that. You're always switching roles. You may be a police officer in one of your dream lifetimes and then a criminal in the next. Gary, or worse, a politician. Persa, politicians have issues. Be kind to them. Then you're being kind to yourself. Gary, I'm trying. Hell, I even succeed a lot. I used to get irritated when a certain politician, I'll let you guess which one, came on the TV screen. I'd react and get upset at how I perceived he was screwing up the country and the world. Then one day he came on the screen and I started to react to him, and I remembered the truth and started to forgive him. Like you taught me, that's the hardest part remembering the truth when the stuff hits the fan. So I started to forgive him and then I thought, you know, he doesn't even know I'm watching. So who's the one who's suffering here? He's probably having a good time. He doesn't know it's an illusion. He thinks he's really the president. Persa, yes, forgiveness is always a gift you're giving to yourself, not the person you think you're forgiving. You're the one who receives the benefits, in both practical and metaphysical terms. True, you're acting as a reminder of the truth to the other person. All thought has effects on some level, and it's good for the other person, too. Not that the other person is really there. I'm talking about a seemingly split-off aspect of your own mind. Gary, yeah, I think that's really cool. I'm actually rejoining with myself at the level of the mind when I forgive. I'm becoming whole again. Plus, if I forgive, I don't suffer. And if I forgive after just one minute instead of thirty minutes, then that's 29 minutes of my life that I didn't spend suffering. Arden, yes. Do you remember how your father-in-law used to get so upset when Bill Clinton came on the TV? Gary, I sure do. He used to actually get red sometimes. He'd even have to change the channel once in a while or leave the room. He suffered for eight years, and then he died. And I can almost guarantee you that Bill Clinton was having a good time. Getting back to our reincarnation instant breakfast here, you seem to be hinting that the reason I have a harder time forgiving some people more than others is because I've known the person who's hard to forgive in another lifetime, and I've got something going on with him or her that I'm not consciously aware of right now. And I understand what you're saying about how it looks like we're reincarnating, but we're really not. It's really just one big gigantic freaking mind trip. We don't really go anywhere. It's like the Course says we're reviewing mentally what has gone by. We're watching our own projection, which is actually coming from our own unconscious mind. It's like when I go to the movies. I want to forget that it's not real. I want it to be real, and my attention is diverted to the screen. Maybe I'll start reacting to the screen as I get into the story, but there's nothing happening there. The screen is just an effect, and the images I'm seeing are actually coming from some place else. If I tried to fix the screen in order to change what's on it, it wouldn't do any good. But there's a projector. It's hidden in the back. I'm not supposed to think about that. Yet that's the cause. That's where what I'm seeing is really coming from. We're watching our own projection, which is actually coming from our own unconscious mind. If I want to have real power, 
then I'd be a lot better off dealing with the cause rather than the effect. If I can change what's in the projector, namely the film, then that would change everything. But in life, or what passes for life, most people spend their entire lives trying to fix what's on the screen, which is just the effect, instead of changing the projector and what's in it, which is the mind and whatever thought system it adheres to. The thoughts come first. I remember reading about doctors doing a study of depressed people and their thoughts. The doctors assumed the patients were having all these bad thoughts because they were depressed. But what they found out was pretty startling. It turned out that the patients were depressed because they had been having all these bad thoughts. Arden, very good. You know, you're almost coherent at times. Gary, that's the nicest thing you've ever said to me. Arden, don't tell anyone. Persa, by the way, you'll use that cause and effect movie analogy in your workshops. Your public teachings, along with your first book, will force other course teachers to get more accurate about what the course is teaching. Right now there are a lot of them who play fast and loose with the course's message. If you point out to them that what they're teaching isn't the same as what the course is saying, then they'll call you a course fundamentalist. Apparently a course fundamentalist is anyone who thinks you should go by what the course actually teaches. You'll go a long way toward ending all that silliness. Your message is so clear that other teachers won't be able to get away from it, and they'll have to adapt or else look like they don't know the course very well. I've got another compliment for you, also. I believe that in the last couple of years you've become a genuinely spiritual man. Gary, that's right, baby. Persa, so we can see how silly it is to deal with the effect and how important it is to deal with the cause which is the mind. That's where the real power is. Before we do a little bit more of our review, we want to make sure you understand that all of your difficult relationships were set up ahead of time and that you wanted them. Gary, yeah, so someone comes along whom I did wrong in a previous life, which I've forgotten, and they give me a hard time, or worse, and I just think it's their fault. The truth is that in a previous lifetime I gave them a hard time, or worse, and they're just in the payback phase. Usually neither one of us knows why we're having such a hard time getting along with the other person. But the whole thing was really set up ahead of time in an ego-written script of time and space, where we take turns being the victim and the victimizer. Would you say that's accurate? Persa, as true as a dream can be. The reason some of your forgiveness lessons are so hard is because your unconscious mind remembers the bad relationship you had with the other person in a previous lifetime, so you've been set up to have tremendous unconscious resistance to forgiving them in this lifetime. Plus, there's the resistance to giving up your personal identity that is always there, because the ego senses that if you practice forgiveness, then this is its end. Everyone has these past life relationships, and the memories are unconscious. That's why it's so much harder to forgive your special hate relationships than your special love relationships. Gary, it's easy to forgive your special love relationships, your family, friends, and lovers, just because you love them. On the other hand, your special hate relationships, the people you don't like, well, you're never gonna forgive those bastards because they don't deserve it. But you think the people you love deserve only good. So even if a member of your family killed somebody, you'd be right there in the courtroom, rooting for them to get off. Yet real love and forgiveness wouldn't exclude anyone. They apply to everyone. They're not special, but universal. The wholeness of them is what makes them real. Persa, Yes. Now, part of what makes the unreal seem possible is that you make some bodies more special than others, and it's a trick so you'll find some of those bodies guilty in your mind and project your own unconscious guilt onto them, which is the reason you made them up in the first place. But, 
What if you really understood that those bodies aren't so special, if anything, just by the sheer number of them that you and those close to you have occupied? Gary, how many bodies have I occupied? Arden, thousands of them. Gary, you mentioned something about thousands of lifetimes during your last visit of the first series, but that seems like an awful lot. Arden, really? Would you like to see them? Gary, what do you mean? Arden, hold on to your seat, brother. You're in for a mind blower. Gary, uh oh. I don't know if I like the sound of that. Note, what happened next made me gasp. Arden and Persa began rapidly changing into different bodies before my eyes. Persa became a black man, and Arden became an elderly woman. They stayed that way for two or three seconds so I could see them and then changed again. This time Persa was a teenage girl, perhaps 16 or 17, and Arden was a boy of the same general age, reflecting the duality of male and female. All of these bodies looked perfectly real, just like Arden and Persa as other bodies. Suddenly they started to change even faster. Within a minute, there were two streams of bodies flowing in front of me, showing countless incarnations of different forms and dressed from different time periods. I then remembered that Arden had asked me, would you like to see them? That's when it hit home. All of these bodies were me. They were showing me all of my different incarnations, thousands of them. The rapid parade of bodies was hypnotizing. I felt almost drawn into the stream of forms, as though I could join with Arten and Persa and change bodies myself. Then I realized that I had already been changing bodies as long as there had been time, which was why I appeared to be here now in the first place. Suddenly the idea of being Gary felt much less significant. If I appeared to incarnate as all of these bodies, then how special was the one I appeared to be in now? Arden and Persa kept changing. There seemed to be a swirling energy throughout the room that peaked at the area of the couch where they were sitting. As the bodies went by, one would occasionally appear that didn't really look human, although they were definitely humanoid. I intuited that these were perhaps alien life forms, but they were going by so quickly I couldn't get a very clear look, only a brief glimpse. Most of the bodies were a variety of men and women, and others not recognizable, of varying shapes, sizes, and colors, young and old, babies and the elderly, well-dressed and practically naked. For what seemed like an hour, it kept flowing, this rapid, holographic show of apparently real bodily images, and then it all stopped instantly, with Arden and Persa appearing once again in the same places where they started. Gary, hey, wait. Go back one. Note, Persa then became a perfect mirror image of my body as it appears now, but Arden disappeared. Gary, where's Arden? Persa appearing as Gary, nice try but it's not time yet for you to see who Arden is in this lifetime. We'll talk about that subject later on. Gary, all right, all right. Can you go back one more? Note, now Persa changed again and appeared as a man approximately 30 years old, and another man appeared where Arden had been sitting. Because of memories I had after Arden and Persa's final visit of the first series, I realized that I was looking at Thomas and Thaddeus, who were later called saints. The most impressive feature of the two, aside from their very kind demeanor, was the fact that they looked much shorter than the people of today. I was not given much time to gaze at them, as Arden and Persa returned very quickly to the form of the bodies they occupied in their final lifetimes, which occurred in our future. A part of understanding this would be that time is holographic, past, present and future all occur simultaneously, and, according to the Course, it's really already over. But we have to complete our lessons to make that real in our experience. Persa, there. 
So now you've seen yourself as you appeared in the past as Thomas, as you look in the present, and as me in the future. You've also seen Thaddeus as he appeared in the past, and as Arden in the future. I think it would be appropriate to let you relax for a minute. Note, after sitting there for another minute or so with my mouth open in stunned contemplation, trying to absorb the astounding visual trip of the previous hour, I started to focus a little, and Persa began speaking again. Persa, the bodies you occupy in your various dream incarnations are symbols of duality. Thus, you have just as many lifetimes where you are rich as you are poor, good as you are evil, good looking as you are unattractive to the eye, famous as you are obscure, healthy as you are sick, and every polarity, duality, and opposite you could possibly think of. None of them are true. It's all a trick. You are your own counterpart. Ultimately, the bodies that are not your own incarnations are also you. Like your own bodies, they reflect the opposites of duality because they symbolize the condition of separation from God. Yet there can be no separation from God. Only God exists, and all else is false. The Course is completely uncompromising on that, for those who care to see it. Arden, remember what I told you before about the idea of separation from God. Because your idea is not of God, he does not respond to it. To respond to it would be to give it reality. If God himself were to acknowledge anything except the idea of perfect oneness, then there would no longer be perfect oneness. There would no longer be a perfect state of heaven for you to return to. As you will see, you never really left anyway. You're still there, but you have entered into a nightmare state of illusion. Only the perfect, non-dualistic oneness of God is real, and nothing else is real. Gary, is that why Bill Thetford referred to the Course as the Christian Vedanta? Arden, yes. Bill understood what the Course was saying. Only the perfect, non-dualistic oneness of God is real, and nothing else is real, which is exactly what that ancient Hindu text, the Vedanta, was saying, although of course, people then took it and misinterpreted it in much the same way they're doing today with the Course. It's imperative that you stick to the message. Don't compromise on it. A Course in Miracles is purely non-dualistic. We don't want the same thing to happen to the message of the Course that happened to J.S. message 2000 years ago. That's one of the main reasons we're back, to help keep people focused, including you. We want you to tell it straight, and if someone criticizes you or your message, then after you forgive them, tell them that they are in error. You have the right to not remain silent. Gary, what about that course workbook lesson, if I defend myself I am attacked? Persa, remember that the teachings of the course are always applied at the level of the mind, and never at the level of form or the physical. That's why it's a course in cause and not effect. In your mind, you use right-minded ideas. Then sometimes after you forgive, you may feel you are being guided in some way by the Holy Spirit as to what you should do or not do. It doesn't have to happen that often. You don't have to be bombarded with inspired ideas. Just one inspired idea can make a huge difference in your life. That's inspiration, which comes as an after-effect of forgiveness in much the same way as it comes as an after-effect of true prayer. Gary, these bodies you showed me, which were all me what about the ones that looked like aliens? What's that all about? Persa, you'll be told all you need to know, brother. Sometimes an incarnation doesn't take place as a human being, even though those who are human spend most, but not all, of their lifetimes as humans. It has to do with the way the universe is set up. What's important is that you realize what your lifetime is for, which is to use it to get home. Gary, it's not gonna be easy for me to describe what I just saw. Arden, don't worry about it, just do it. Anyway, 
I could repeat a piece of advice we gave to you before. Don't spend a lot of time trying to describe us, and that would include the way we looked as Thomas and Thaddeus. The purpose here is not to dwell on bodies. What we do is use bodies to teach you of the unreality of all bodies, and to stress that ultimately no body is more important or more real than any other body. That's what the Holy Spirit does. He uses the illusion to lead you out of the illusion. True forgiveness is an illusion, too, but it gets you home. Without it, you'd be stuck here in unhappy dreamland forever. Gary, it's not always unhappy. Arden, just another trick, brother. I'm not saying it isn't good sometimes. But even then, without wholeness, it feels like there's something missing. What's missing is your perfect oneness with God. The universe of time and space is meant to cover over the one and only problem, which is the seeming separation from God, and especially the one and only solution, which is to go home through forgiveness. As the Course says, and this is very important, a sense of separation from God is the only lack you really need correct. If that's the only lack, then all the others are simply symbolic of the first and only lack. Incidentally, as well as not spending too much time describing us, I'd like to point out that you made the right decision in not taking pictures of us the first time around and also getting rid of those tapes, which you should also do this time. Gary, it was very tempting for me to hold on to them, you know. Persa, we know. But if they got out, then people would have been distracted. Instead of focusing on the teachings, now the conversation would become about whether or not the tapes are authentic. Who's really on the tapes? There are already too many distractions out there. Use the tapes for your own purpose of accuracy, and then get rid of them again. If somebody doesn't like it or doesn't think you are explaining your actions adequately, then so be it. The bigger picture is more important. Let's keep people's focus where it belongs, bro. Gary, bro? You're reminding me of Hawaii. I've still only been there twice, you know. Arden, take heart, bro. You'll be there two more times within the next year or so, once on the way back from Australia. Gary, Australia. Are you serious? Arden, not too serious, but you are going to those places to share the teachings. Gary, I don't believe it. When I was a kid, a place like Australia may as well have been Mars, it seemed so unreachable. Arden, well, it's not unreachable anymore. Just remember when you get there that it's all a mind trip. Also, people are basically the same everywhere. They may speak differently, but they think pretty much the same. Eventually you'll be going to places where you'll need a translator. Gary, let's hope they do a better job of translation than that computer gizmo we tried. Note, after the publication of The Disappearance of the Universe, my first publisher, D. Patrick Miller, and I heard that there was some talk about the book on the internet from other countries. One of them was Holland. We found a web page where someone was talking about the book and tried to have a computer program translate it. However, a computer program only knows how to give a literal translation, and simply provides the words that are the closest to those being translated. The computer can't translate the meaning, which is what a real translator does. In describing how I said at the beginning of the book that I felt as though I had a relationship with Jesus, the translation came out, the writer bathed with Jesus. Persa, that bathing with Jesus idea might go over in Holland. Gary, I'd rather bathe with you. Persa, I'll be kind and overlook that. You're still freaked out from seeing all those bodies. Gary, yeah, and you know. Some of them weren't bad. Arden, how about if we move on and save people a few lifetimes here? We haven't finished our review of the teachings. For example, 
we've talked about the unconscious guilt that's in the mind and how it has to be removed by the Holy Spirit. Why? How did it get there? Would you like to share some more of your learning with us? Gary, sure, as long as you correct me, if necessary. Let's say you have God, and God is perfect oneness. There isn't anything else. God creates, but what he creates is exactly the same as he is. It's a sharing of perfect love that's beyond anything we can understand with a mind that isn't whole. Yet the experience of it is so great that it's totally awesome. Anyway, there's this thought that seems to occur. It's a meaningless thought that's over in just an instant. It's totally insignificant. It's a separation thought like, what would it be like for me to go off and create on my own? That idea implies an individual existence. As you mentioned, God doesn't respond to it. He's no fool and keeps reality perfect and one, but that thought of separation makes something different appear to happen in our experience. Now here's the hard part, it doesn't really happen. It only appears to. Just like it's possible for a dream I have at night to seem totally real, this dream may also seem totally real, but it's not. In fact, other parts of the dream are made to seem less real so we'll think that the most clear part of the dream is real. That's a function of levels, which can't even exist in perfect oneness. This different experience that appears to happen to us is occurring on a massive metaphysical level. We'll call this experience consciousness. As far as I know, A Course in Miracles is the only spiritual teaching in the world that exposes consciousness for what it really is. The Course says, consciousness, the level of perception, was the first split introduced into the mind after the separation, making the mind a perceiver rather than a creator. Consciousness is correctly identified as the domain of the ego. People think consciousness is really significant because we want what we made to be important. So we glorify it and measure it and attach specialness to it when it's really just a symbol of separation from our source. It's separation, because in order to have consciousness, you have to have more than one thing. You have to have a subject and an object. You have to have something else to be conscious of. That's where two-ness came from to replace oneness. That's what makes the resulting symbolic illusory opposites, polarities, and dualities. So from two-ness springs forth multiplicity, but it's all symbolic of the original idea of separation. Multiplicity breeds chaos. But underneath it all there are basic ideas, and these ideas can only seem to be real when you experience yourself as being apart from oneness. For example, the ideas of scarcity and death. There can be no scarcity in fullness, but once you have ideas like separation and opposites, then you have the possibility of all kinds of weird things showing up. That's why it says in the book of Genesis, You shall not eat of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, for on the day you eat of it you shall die. Well, good and evil are opposites, and once you have opposites then you have death. There can be no death in heaven, where there is only eternal life, but once you have opposites, then you have a seeming opposite to life, which is death. It doesn't really exist. That's why the Course says, right in its introduction that the opposite of love is fear, but what is all-encompassing can have no opposite. What is all-encompassing is true, and what's not all-encompassing, or perfectly whole, doesn't really exist. Arden, the Course also says, about your salvation, that it restores to your awareness the wholeness of the fragments you perceive as broken off and separate. And it is this that overcomes the fear of death. For separate fragments must decay and die, but wholeness is immortal. Gary, immortal. I don't recall the Course using that word very much. Arden, you'd be surprised. Please continue. Gary, all right. As a response to the false condition of separation, real forgiveness denies what isn't true and accepts what's true. 
As Jay puts it in his course, it denies the ability of anything not of God to affect you. Arden, that reflects the Course's knowledge that what is immortal cannot be attacked, what is but temporal has no effect. Gary, okay, immortal guy. For most of us, our experience that we are here seems very real, but to understand why that's the case, we have to go back to the metaphysical level, which is now unconscious to us. We'll see why in a minute. But on that metaphysical level, before the universe of time and space was made, we feel an absolutely terrible loss, and we experience it on a scale that we can't even begin to imagine now. Persa, very good. You need to understand that before that, everything was perfect in your experience. You were totally taken care of, totally provided for, with no problems and nothing but ecstasy. The perfect joy of this cannot be translated into words. But now, with this idea of separation, it's as though you've made a major blunder. It's like you've lost God, which means it's like you've lost everything. The only experience in this world that could come close to matching how you felt at that time of the original separation from God would be if the person you love most in this world died. What happens when that person dies? You're separate. You think you can never get them back. Of course that's not true because no one ever dies, but it feels and looks that way to you. It's really a symbol of the first separation being acted out in this world. And the original separation, which was from God on that metaphysical level, has you feeling terrible. Arden, because opposites follow as a result of division, there are now two possible ways of thinking about all of this, the right way, which we'll call the Holy Spirit's interpretation, and the wrong way, which we'll call the ego's interpretation. God did not send the Holy Spirit to rescue you. The Holy Spirit could be said to be your memory of your true home with God, which is the right part of your mind. The ego is the wrong part of your mind. At first people think that the Course is talking to them as a person, because that's what they think they are. But the you that the Course is addressing is actually your seemingly separated mind that needs to choose to listen to the right teacher instead of the wrong one. That's not easy, because you feel terrible, and the ego is going to play on your fears. In this new experience of consciousness, you think you've lost everything and the ego is more than happy to make you think you've done something wrong. You're in for it, man. God's very angry at what you've done. Now, if you've done something wrong, what's that but the idea of sin? And if you've sinned, then that means you're guilty. And if you're guilty, that means that you're going to be punished. But on this level, you think you're going to be punished by God himself. That results in the fear of God, which you still have, even though it's unconscious to you. The terrible guilt in your mind over this is still buried there, but with the mind being holographic, the experience of the truth is still buried there as well. The Holy Spirit could be said to be your memory of your true home with God, which is the right part of your mind. Persa, yes, and that truth, given to you by the Holy Spirit, is a completely different story. The Holy Spirit's message is, what's your problem? You know God. You've been with Him forever. He gives you everything. What's He ever done except love you? All you have to do is forget about this silly idea and go home. Problem solved. Arden, the ego has to come up with something fast. It likes the idea of having a separate identity. So it says, look, you've got to get away, and I have a place we can go. The ego knows you're hurting and wouldn't mind getting away if you could, but you don't know how. So the ego says, if you come with me, you'll be free of this terrible pain you're feeling. That's exactly what you want to get away from but you're still not sure about giving up on what the Holy Spirit is saying. So the ego has to throw in a bonus. It says, look, if you come with me, 
then you can be God. You can make up your own life. You'll have your own personal identity. You can call the shots. You can be special. That's the icing on the cake. Now, not only are you going to get away from this terrible feeling you have, but on top of it, you get to be God. Gary, I thought I was doing the review. Persa, is that why you were just talking to yourself a little during Arden's presentation? Gary, hey, if I can't talk to me, then who can? Arden, let's briefly explain why all of this seems so real to you today. The ego has an ingenious plan. When you choose the ego on the metaphysical level we've been talking about, it's the same as joining with it. There is then a massive denial of everything that is in the mind that we discussed. However, when you deny something, it has to go somewhere. You think you're escaping from it by denying it, but you're not. You're really just pushing it underneath the surface and out of your awareness. This causes it to be unconscious. So all of the new ideas that couldn't exist in wholeness, ideas like sin, guilt, fear, scarcity, death, attack, that whole kin of worms, are denied and then projected outward. Even on the level of the world, a psychologist will tell you that projection always follows denial. But here we're talking about something on an incredible scale. As Jay puts it in the course, you do not realize the magnitude of that one error. He also says, listening to the ego's voice means that you believe it is possible to attack God, and that a part of him has been torn away by you. Fear of retaliation from without follows, because the severity of the guilt is so acute that it must be projected. Do you get the stunning implications of all this? Gary, I can't believe I'm going to Australia. Arden, moving along, we see that everything you wanted to escape from, all the terrible things you thought were true about yourself, which can be summed up in just a couple of words, like guilt, as well as the fear of punishment for the retaliation that you believe is going to follow because you are guilty all of it is denied, projected outward, and seen as being outside of you. This causes the making of the universe of time and space, starting with the Big Bang. The real purpose of that universe, although you've forgotten it through denial, is for you to appear to escape what you're feeling and believing about yourself. Now it's no longer in you, it's out there. Of course there isn't really anything out there, but it looks that way. It's an optical illusion but done on a multi-sensory scale that we'll get to in a second. The thing to remember here is what the Course says about the fact that ideas leave not their source. So, yes, it may look like you've escaped from those things by projecting them outside of you, but it's just an illusion, and they're still in your mind. It just doesn't seem that way because it's been denied and you're oblivious to it. So it looks like it's outside of you and you've forgotten that when you joined with the ego, you made it. That brings up a very important principle from the Course, projection makes perception. In fact, why don't you read just the first few sentences of that part from the text? Gary, okay, teach. What page is it on? Arden, 445. Gary, right at the top. Projection makes perception. The world you see is what you gave it, nothing more than that. But though it is no more than that, it is not less. Therefore, to you it is important. It is the witness to your state of mind, the outside picture of an inward condition. Wow! I never quite thought of it this way. I made what I'm seeing. Persa, you got it, brother. But it doesn't feel that way because of the massive denial. That also applies to all of the bodies you see, including your own. The purpose of the body is to make the illusion seem real. But since the body is part of the illusion, it can hardly be counted on to tell you of the illusion's unreality. It was given form by the same decision to be separate through projection, 
which is what made the entire illusion in the first place. You wanted the separation so the guilt would be in other bodies and not yours, and thus outside of you and in them. But because projection made the perception of everything, the cause of it all is still right there in your mind, and minds can be changed. As the Course puts it, the result of an idea is never separate from its source. The idea of separation produced the body and remains connected to it. So now you feel stuck in a body that has to live with all these other bodies. All of your senses, not just sight, tell you that the world is completely real. It looks and feels totally authentic. From the moment you are born to the moment you die, it's all about the survival and success of your body, from attaining material comfort to receiving special love. It doesn't take too much power of observation to see that your society is crazed over bodies and the attainment of sex. Gary, I can understand that. I had sex once, and it was one of the happiest minutes of my life. Persa, don't forget something, dear one. In a world of duality, even the good times have to turn bad eventually, even if it's merely through death. That's because what's really going on here is the reliving of the separation from God over and over again in different forms. It's like playing a DVD of the same thing over and over again, separation. The way Jay puts it about your life is, you but relieve the single instant when the time of terror took the place of love. Gary, I like that Jesus. He really sticks to the course. So it may look like all these things and people are out there, but they're not. They're not real people, it just looks that way. I made what I'm seeing, then I forgot. And I wanted it to be the way it is so what I secretly believed to be true about myself, what the Course calls the secret sins and hidden hates that I have buried in my mind about me over the original separation are now seen to be in others and in the world. And what holds the whole thing in place is my judgment and condemnation of others. Persa, yes. Exactly. And it's all set up to ensure that you will judge and condemn and keep the whole vicious cycle going underneath the surface. That's how the ego survives, through the projection of unconscious guilt. It's never your fault that you don't feel happy and peaceful, it's their fault. You see it at work in relationships, whether individual or with countries. Unless they're one of your special loved ones, or an ally, it's always the other one's fault, and they're not even there. Not really, although it certainly looks and feels that way, which is testimony to how well you've been set up in the first place. And even if you do blame yourself, what is it that you're blaming? Just another body, because when you hold your hand up in front of your face and look at it, what is that? It's a body that's been projected. Of course you think it's a very special body because you think it's you, but it's not. It's just one out of all of the bodies you've projected. That body you see when you look in the mirror is no more real than the other bodies you see in the mirror you call the world. Gary and the world and all of its bodies are symbolic of the separation, and the massive, ontological guilt we felt over it, and thus the need to escape from it through denial and projection. Arden, that's what the universe is, brother, your scapegoat. As Jay says in the Course, that was the first projection of error outward. The world arose to hide it, and became the screen on which it was projected and drawn between you and the truth. Now your job becomes to undo it in your mind, so you can return home. Which brings up the one solution, forgiveness, to the one problem, separation. We'll talk more about forgiveness as we go along. It's way more important than most people think. It's vital that they stay focused on it. True forgiveness means you don't judge and condemn another. There's not really any sin and guilt out there because none of what we've been talking about happened except in a dream, and dreams are not real. So Jay counsels you in his course not to make the ideas of sin and guilt real in the people, events, and situations you see in the world, 
call it not sin but madness, for such it was and so it still remains. Invest it not with guilt, for guilt implies it was accomplished in reality. And above all, be not afraid of it. When you seem to see some twisted form of the original error rising to frighten you, say only, God is not fear but love and it will disappear. Gary, if only it were that easy. Arden, we never said it was easy, Gary. But the truth is simple. It's what the ego made that's complicated. And that's what needs to be undone by your forgiveness. The more the ego is undone, the easier it will get for you. You're already doing well. We're going to explain forgiveness off and on throughout the visits in this cycle. By the time we're finished with you, you'll know what to do in every situation, not just intellectually, but experientially. For now, remember that if ideas have not left their source, then what you're seeing has never left the mind. If it's in the mind, and if minds can be changed, then the mind is where real power is. What made Jay and Buddha who they were was that they were not tricked by appearances. The illusion exists to make you think you have put distance in between you and your guilt, but by making it real and judging and condemning it, you simply keep it in place. The ego has tricked you. In order to ensure its own survival, it has set you up to judge others. Now that you know the truth, it's time to put an end to all of that nonsense and go home where you belong. You're actually still there, but it's out of your awareness, although you are fortunate enough to have had lovely glimpses of it. We call it true forgiveness because it's not the same as the way the world usually thinks of it, and you'll have unconscious resistance to this kind of forgiveness because the ego senses this is its end, and would rather kill you than have you kill it. There are teachers who will tell you to make friends with your ego or make peace with your ego as a way of dealing with it. All that will do is keep it in place. Besides, if you practice true forgiveness, which is the only way out, then the ego isn't interested in being your colleague. As Jay says, you are threatening the ego's whole defensive system too seriously for it to bother to pretend it is your friend. Your job is not to keep the ego in place, your job is to undo it through the dynamic of right-minded thinking, which we'll be talking to you about. As the Course says, salvation is undoing. It's time for you to turn it up a notch, bro. Not just for you, but for everyone who is ready to listen. Are you ready? Gary, hell, yeah. Persa. One of the most important things is not to make the universe of time and space real. You're innocent because it's not real. Don't spiritualize the universe. Don't spiritualize matter or energy. Energy looks like matter to you sometimes only because of the way you perceive it and perceive yourself. You perceive yourself as being in a body, and then the body tells you what to feel. But you should be the one who tells the body what to feel. You are not in the body, the body is in your mind. When you put the mind in its proper perspective, then you're taking charge of the cause instead of being at the mercy of the effect. Then you can choose the Holy Spirit and his answer instead of the ego's questions. Thus will you be returned to wholeness. Because of that, how you experience things will change on this level, and the Holy Spirit will take care of the job on the larger, metaphysical scale. Make no mistake, there's a difference in levels between this and other teachings. The rest of them are moving things around in a universe that isn't really there. That's like moving the furniture around in a burning house. Yes, it might look nicer for a little while, but it's denying the real problem. A Course in Miracles, on the other hand, is the undoing of all of it, and the return to the only thing that is real. Remember what we've said so far and integrate it. There will be more. Use your speaking and traveling the best you can as lessons for forgiveness, and we'll be back in two months. Then Arden and Persa disappeared, and I sat there thinking about everything they had said, 
and the many twists and turns my life had taken over the years. I realized now what it was all for. It was to be used to undo that which made it, and return to our real creator. For some reason, I remembered back to when I was a depressed teenager suffering from scoliosis and with nothing to look forward to. I could have certainly used the knowledge back then of what it was all for. But I had lived long enough to find the Holy Spirit, and turn a meaningless existence into a life with purpose and ultimately, the only real purpose. Life of Gary No one who learns from experience that one choice brings peace and joy while another brings chaos and disaster needs additional convincing. In the weeks that followed, I would occasionally remember what Arden had said about the ego. Would it really rather kill me than have me kill it? I knew the Course itself said that the ego is capable of suspiciousness at best and viciousness at worst. That is its range. That wasn't a pretty thought. But I also knew that the Course said, do not be afraid of the ego. It depends on your mind, and as you made it by believing in it, so you can dispel it by withdrawing belief from it. So I came to feel that Arden wasn't trying to scare me but to simply let me know what I was up against. How can a problem be fixed if you don't know what the problem is? I also thought it was interesting that the Course used the word dispel, because I was realizing that's exactly what the universe of time and space is, one gigantic mother freaking spell that I'd put myself under. Now my job was to dispel it by giving up my belief in the ego, a teacher I had listened to for much too long. My belief was now in the Holy Spirit, but that didn't mean I wouldn't be tempted by the ego. I had been tempted all of my life. In fact, the Course's idea of the ego's form of temptation was to regard myself as a body. To that end, like everyone else, I was born as a perfect little victim. I forgot what came before birth and sincerely believed this was my beginning. Now I was totally at the effect of everything and not the cause. Now I was a body that was caused by other bodies. That way, it wasn't my fault. I didn't ask to be born. It was my parents' fault. They did it. Then this whole story got going about why things were the way that they were. But of course the truth was that I did ask to be born, and the world I found was exactly what I asked to be born into. I was born in Salem, Massachusetts. Don't read anything into that. There were no witches in Salem 300 years ago, they all moved there in the 1970s. Now it's a really good tourist thing. My teachers had told me that the Salem witch trials were a classic example of the projection of unconscious guilt. Somebody else has to be found who's the cause of the problem, and any excuse will do as long as it's them and not you. But what goes around comes around, and your turn always arrives eventually. My mother was a virgin. She just wasn't very good at it. All right, she wasn't a virgin. Of course, J.S. mother wasn't a virgin either, but it's a cute story. I was born two months premature. I weighed less than three pounds and wasn't expected to live. Babies that small didn't usually live back then. They shoved me in an incubator, stuck me in the corner as if to say, good luck, kid, and that was it for a while. Mothers didn't always bond right away with their infants like they do today. It was perfect. I had every excuse in the world to be screwed up. I was born with scoliosis, a very noticeable curvature of my spine yet I didn't find out about it until I was 31 years old. We didn't have any money. Back in the 50s, people who didn't have any money or health insurance didn't get good health care, and it's nice to see that some things don't change. In hindsight, I can see that the scoliosis robbed me of all my energy. When the spine is malformed like mine was then, the energy can't circulate. It's as if the brain is sending a signal to the body, but the telephone line is down and the message can't get through. 
I didn't know at the time that it's the mind and not the brain that tells the body what to do. I was still at the effect of things. As a result of that, by the time I was a teenager I didn't have much energy at all. I went to school only because I had to. Even then I missed about 30 days one year, and they threatened to kick me out. After school I'd usually just sit there in front of the TV and not want to do anything. My parents were starting to get worried, all of my friends were out finding jobs, getting girls and having a good time, and I was sitting there with no desire or ambition. This made me feel different, like there was something wrong. That's right up the ego's alley. What's guilt but the feeling that there's something wrong with you? I'm sure I was depressed, but people didn't care about depression in the 60s. Now everybody's depressed, and you have the doping of America going on. But back then it was like, depressed? What do you mean you're depressed? Get a job. Fortunately for me, a group came over to America from England called the Beatles. I remember walking one day in Beverly, Massachusetts, the town where I lived most of the first half of my life, which is just north of Salem, right on the sea coast. I went into a store called Hayes Music, which put records on so people could listen to them and decide whether or not to buy them. Somebody asked the owner to put on a record by this new group that was getting a lot of publicity and was going to be on the Ed Sullivan show. The song was She Loves You. After listening to that two and a half minute song, I was never the same. The guitar work by George Harrison sent shivers up and down my spine, which was really cool because I never felt anything in my spine. I knew right then exactly what I wanted to do. I was going to be a guitar player. I did become a guitar player. The idea wasn't that much of a stretch. My father, Raleigh, played guitar and my uncle Doug was one of the best guitar teachers in New England. He had played on national radio, NBC, back before television, when radio was the big deal. If he had been willing to tour, he could have made it big. The same was true of my father, who was a fine singer as well. They were both in a famous group in the 40s called the Moonlight Serenaders, but they chose not to tour due to family considerations. They ended up making a living the best they could in the New England area, both as soloists and in various bands together. My future uncle introduced my parents to each other. They were gentle souls, both Pisceans, and hit it off immediately. I was born a Pisces as well. My mother, Louise, and my grandfather were also musicians, but until the Beatles, I didn't have the desire to become one myself. George Harrison, God bless him, was my first false idol. I modeled my guitar playing after him, even though I learned the basics from Uncle Doug. I didn't become a great guitar player. It takes a lot of drive, energy, and ambition to be great at anything, no matter what it is. Natural talent isn't enough. It takes work to develop it. I did become a good guitar player, though. I had enough musical ability, which I had inherited, and enough taste to make myself sound good. Eventually I was even successful at it. When the time came to graduate from high school in 1969, I found myself in a tough situation. I didn't want to go to college. I hated school. I couldn't imagine how they could take such fascinating subjects and somehow manage to make them boring, but they did. I also couldn't stand the cliques and the dynamics of belonging to one group and not another. I wanted out. All I wanted to do was play my guitar. But there was this thing going on called the war in Vietnam. There were about a hundred American men getting killed every week there and that didn't even count the ten times that many who were getting wounded and maimed. I wasn't excited about the idea of going to war, but America had a military draft. I also didn't want to go to college, but if I didn't, then I wouldn't get a college deferment, 
and I'd be classified 1A, which would mean I could be drafted and sent to Vietnam at any time. I didn't have enough political conviction to want to go to Canada or actively avoid the draft in some other way. My scoliosis wouldn't keep me out of the military unless I was rich or politically connected enough to have influence. After all, I could walk. I was classified 1A in March of 1970. Fortunately for me, a man had been elected President of the United States in 1968, and took office in 1969, whose name was Richard Nixon. I despised him and his campaign promise that he had a secret plan to end the war. When he got into office, he sure knew how to keep a secret. I wondered how the American people could possibly be so stupid. It would eventually take longer to withdraw our troops from Vietnam than it took the United States to win World War II. However, after taking office, Nixon did one of the biggest favors anybody has ever done for me. He got Congress to switch over to something called the draft lottery system. The way a draft lottery works is they draw these little balls with dates written on them like it's a lottery. They draw all 365 or 366 days if it's a leap year, that they're doing the drawing for, and whatever order the days come up determines the order in which the people with those dates as their birthdays will get drafted. The order in which your birth date is drawn is your draft lottery number. If your birthday is drawn in the top one-third, say from 1 to 122 or so, you're almost certain to get drafted. If you're in the middle third, from 122 to 244, it's kind of iffy. But if your birthday is drawn in the bottom third, from 244 to 366, then you have almost no chance of getting drafted. On July 1, 1970, the draft lottery was conducted for my birth year. I remember praying the old-fashioned way, please, God, have my number come up around 300 so I don't have to worry about this crap. When my birthday, March 6, was drawn, I was number 296. At the age of 19, I was free. I had played by the rules and lucked out. I didn't have to worry about being drafted. I was free to just play my guitar and live happily ever after, right? That's not the way things work in this world. If you solve one problem in the universe of time and space, then what you get is another problem. That's the way it's set up so you'll keep looking for answers in the wrong place out there in the world where the problem appears to be instead of where it really is, which is in the mind that caused the one real problem in the first place. The next problem I cooked up was that I started to drink. Then I started to drink some more. Then I started to smoke a lot of grass. And that pretty much covers the 1970s. I knew that wasn't a good thing and that I was ruining my life. I didn't play my guitar very much, and I was drunk a lot. I was a lousy son, and I only lived for my next chance to get wasted. Both of my parents died during the 70s, and I felt terribly guilty over the way I had acted and some of the things I had said to them. During this dismal time in my life, I tried to find ways to deal with my drinking and smoking although I certainly didn't see pot as the main problem. I never got into trouble if I only smoked grass. It was when I drank that the dark side took over. For some reason, I never felt comfortable with AA, even though I knew it worked for a lot of people. I was a binge drinker. I didn't drink all the time, so I used that as a reason why I wasn't an alcoholic. Still, I at least recognized that I had a problem. In one attempt to handle it, I decided that I was going to become a born-again Christian. I did, but it wore off after a little while. Later on I tried it again. I was actually born again a couple of times in the 1970s. The good thing about it was that I read the Bible, and it was actually a very interesting experience. There were a lot of things in the Bible I could agree with, 
for example, the idea that God is love. That made sense to me. At one point it even said, God is perfect love. That made perfect sense to me. The only problem was that if I looked someplace else in the Bible, he was a killer. He was wrathful and vengeful and getting even with people. That didn't make sense to me. How could he be both? The Bible was too conflicted to ring true for me, however, when I looked at the parts where Jesus spoke, like in the Sermon on the Mount, which contained so many beautiful passages about love and forgiveness, it did ring true for me. But it was more than that. There was something about the nature of J.S. voice that seemed familiar to me. I felt as though I knew him. I couldn't quite put my finger on it, but for some reason I felt like he was my friend and that I could talk to him. It wasn't a religious thing. I've never been religious. I like to joke that in the winter I'm a Buddhist, and in the summer I'm a nudist. But even though I couldn't stick with Christianity, I never gave up on this relationship I felt with Jay, and it continues to this day. Even after Arden and Persa started appearing to me, it was still Jay whom I would talk to in between visits. He's the manifestation of the Holy Spirit for me, even though Arden and Persa are also certainly manifestations of the Holy Spirit. I wouldn't realize exactly why I felt such a strong connection to Jay until Arden and Persa explained it to me at the end of their first series of appearances. After my foray into organized religion, which included two baptisms, I went back to drinking. I don't know if I ever would have stopped if it weren't for the opportunity to participate in a two-weekend experience that came to New England from California called the EST Training. Developed by Werner Erhardt, the training, as we called it, borrowed from other disciplines, including Zen and Scientology. It was a brilliant fusion of advanced metaphysical ideas, a sophisticated knowledge of how the mind works, and exercises that were designed to produce an experience on the part of the participants. I did the training at the Ramada Inn in East Boston in December of 1978. That was the turning point of my spiritual path in this lifetime. In the 70s and 80s, I didn't think in terms of spirit, but looking back, I can see that the Holy Spirit was working through my mind the whole time. The EST training itself was eventually sold and evolved into other forms. One of the themes of EST was taking responsibility for your life. It was about not being a victim. It contained a couple of ideas I would see explained in more detail later in the course, like the great workbook lesson, I am not the victim of the world I see. EST also explained what the ego was, from a Buddhist perspective how the mind is a survival machine and reality is not what we assume it to be. In fact, it explained how what we see with our eyes is not real, and the unseen is more real. It was a very auspicious introduction to spiritual and metaphysical themes, as well as an experiential breakthrough. It was while doing EST that I had what I would describe as my first mystical experience. A group of 20 of us at a time were told to get up on the stage in front of the other 200 people, be silent, stand still, and just look at the crowd. After a couple of minutes, I did a double take and looked at the people again. It was as though everyone in the room was moving in slow motion. I found with many such experiences that there's an intuition associated with them that tells you, in an unarticulated way, what they mean. Somehow you just know. In this case, even though it only lasted a minute or so, when I saw the crowd moving in this surrealistic, slow-motion sort of way, the experience associated with it was that I was the one who was doing it. Now I was the one in charge of time and space. I could make it speed up or slow down. Time wasn't something that was being done to me, it was being done by me. It wasn't coming at me it was coming from me. This was a reversal of cause and effect. That was just the beginning of a learning process on the subject, but a fascinating one. 
It was also the first of a series of mystical experiences, usually very visual, that would apparently last for the rest of my life. As a result of doing the EST training and taking responsibility for my life, something shifted in my unconscious mind. People think it's the beliefs that they have in their conscious mind that runs them, and that they can control their mind by changing their thoughts from negative to positive ones. That's not true when it comes to the big picture. It will only have a temporarily helpful impact. What really runs us are the beliefs we have that are unconscious to us, the things we can't see. A Course in Miracles presents a way to actually heal and remove the things that are hidden in the deep canyons of the unconscious mind. Very few spiritual teachings do anything on that level. The EST training, by recognizing the difference between cause and effect, did have an impact on the unconscious mind of many of its participants, including me. This was despite the fact that the training, like almost all other disciplines, did not understand the total picture or include the relatively rapid method of undoing the ego that I would learn over a period of years from my ascended friends. Just getting a taste of real power created a situation where I made an unconscious decision that I was going to change my life and get well. Although that decision was out of my awareness at the time, it did show up as an effect in the form of my conscious thoughts and behavior. As a result, within a few years I became almost the opposite of myself. My friend Dan Stnuck and I started a band together. Dan was a great singer, and we had worked together in other bands before, but this time we had commitment and discipline. It was Dan who had introduced me to the training. Our group was excellent and I went from being a guitar player who didn't work very much to one who was eventually working five or six nights every week, often twice a day on weekends. I also organized the band's jobs, and after a few years I had us booked two years in advance. We started to become well known in New England, and I was making good money. It was fun to be successful. People were recognizing me on the street from seeing me play, and my relatives didn't think I was a jerk anymore. I made up for lost time and lived two meaningful decades in the 1980s to make up for the ten years I'd blown. I was going out and doing everything that time permitted, walking on hot coals, jumping out of airplanes, and having all the fun I felt I had missed. I still didn't know it was a dream. I thought it was real, and I was determined to make the most of it. After a couple of years in the band, I met a woman named Karen. She was my type, female, but I had been painfully shy around women for years. When I turned 14 years old, a very bad case of acne destroyed my confidence. From then on, it would be impossible for me to just walk up to a woman and talk to her. For some reason, Karen and I hit it off. We felt comfortable with each other and we were married within a year and five months from the time we met. The marriage was often difficult, and I would later say in public that we were each other's best forgiveness lesson. It was a year later that my decision to get well would bring into my space, as we called it an EST, another way for that decision to play itself out. I heard about a chiropractor named Bruce Hedendel who had a practice in Gloucester and also was the chiropractor for the Boston Ballet. He was a genius at what he did. I went there with still not enough energy to do the things I wanted to do in life, and he told me about my scoliosis. He took out a mirror and showed me the curvature in my spine, which I had never seen. Bruce worked on me, and within two months most of it was gone. Not all chiropractors are created equal, but I had found a great one. Two years later, much to my chagrin, Bruce moved to Florida. But he helped turn my energy level around enough so that I could do what I needed to do without suffering. My scoliosis was not completely cured. To this day I'm still not a high energy person and probably never will be, but by 1982 I could function satisfactorily, which to me seemed like a miracle. During the ADS, my spiritual path began to accelerate. 
To show you how new I was to spirituality at the beginning of the decade, I remember doing an EST seminar at the Bradford Hotel in Boston. They broke us down into small sharing groups of four people so we could relate our experiences. I was sitting across from a very sophisticated and highly intelligent woman who was a professor at Harvard, and I must admit that I was intimidated by her success in education. All of a sudden she started talking about a woman named Jane Roberts and how she was channeling this ancient being named Seth, who was thousands of years old. Seth would speak and give enlightened information through this woman. I remember looking at this professor and incredulously thinking to myself, is she serious? Does she really believe that? Does she really think that could happen? Twenty-three years later, I'd find myself standing in front of groups of people and telling them that two ascended masters appeared to me in person on my living room couch. I couldn't help but feel that there was probably someone out in the audience who was thinking, is he serious? Does he really believe that? Does he really think that could happen? I read a few spiritual books in the next few years. I wasn't much of a reader, but I enjoyed some of them. When I read about things like Buddhism, Hinduism, and Taoism, I realized that I already knew most of the things that were being taught. Studying reincarnation brought home for me the idea that the reason I already knew most of these things intuitively was that I had studied them before in other lifetimes. My spiritual memories were reawakening in my mind. In 1983, four years after my mother had passed and seven years after my father had, I had a dream that was nothing like a dream. It was real, or at least as real as any other experience I've ever had. Both of my parents came to me. There was no need to say anything. The two of them walked up to me, and we all hugged very closely for a long time. It was an experience of total love. I felt them there with me, their touches were real, and they were saying not with words but with their love that everything was all right. They were absolving me, forgiving me, and loving me. It was so real that I knew they were fine and as far as they were concerned, everything was forgiven. That's not to say that I had completely forgiven myself, but this experience was both a symbol and a bridge for me to cross, and the realization that I didn't have to spend the rest of my life in guilt. I understood that all my parents ever wanted for me was happiness and love, and the beautiful and liberating realization of that would always stay with me on the road ahead. I also experimented with meditation. Rather than learning what others were doing, I seemed to know what I should do and developed my own technique. However, I didn't really take the time to practice enough and perfect it. That would come later. In the next few years, there was a heightening of my visual mystical ability. It got to the point where I would go to bed at night and close my eyes, and while lying there still awake, I'd see scenes, like a movie, parading in front of my eyes. The images I saw appeared to be from past lifetimes, often with sound. Once in a while I would make a connection between a person I was seeing in my third eye movie, as I came to think of it, and a person whom I knew in this lifetime. The scenes were often visually stunning. One would involve American Indians hunting, talking in a group or walking along a river. Another would be on a ship, another in front of a fireplace in a small house. Despite popular myth, the Holy Spirit doesn't always spell things out for you. I didn't always understand what I was seeing or where and when the events were taking place. Despite popular myth, the Holy Spirit doesn't always spell things out for you. It's like Spirit is leading you giving you hints until you yourself are ready to have the aha experience you are being led to. You're shown pieces of the puzzle, whatever is best for you at the time, and then usually you put it all together later when you're ready, exactly when you're supposed to. Such experiences were enthralling at times, and I wanted to develop my spiritual life. After seven years of being in the band, which was called Hush, 
not to be confused with another band of the same name that exists today, I realized that I wasn't really happy, which was a shocking realization for me. I had done almost everything I wanted to do in the previous few years, but it wasn't fulfilling. Something was missing. I didn't know what, but I knew I had to find out. This was disturbing because not doing anything didn't make me happy, and now doing everything didn't make me happy either. Would I ever be happy? During the harmonic convergence in August of 1987, I made another decision to change my life. When an interplanetary alignment like the harmonic convergence occurs, it looks like it's happening out in the sky but that's just a symbol. Where it's really taking place is in the unconscious mind. Then it shows up out in the sky. At a time like that, people are making decisions on a collective level that will change their attitudes and goals, and in some cases their places of residence and their careers. I realized that I wanted to quit my life in the fast lane and find a quiet place where I could think. Because I had my name on many signed contracts, it took more than two years for me to get out of the band, but at the beginning of 1990 I found myself driving to the town of Poland Spring, Maine, with Karen and our dog, Nupi. This was only 120 miles from Beverly, Massachusetts, but a world apart. Once you get north of Portland, Maine, it's nothing like Massachusetts which is fast and sophisticated. Northern Maine is slow and simple. It's the most heavily wooded state in America, 90% of the land is covered with trees. There's clean air, clean water, and the lowest crime rate in the country. If I wanted peace and quiet, I'd come to the right place. If I wanted money, I hadn't. I had a vague idea of starting a business and making a living. When I got to Poland Spring, there were no sidewalks and not many people. I should have done more research, but my life in Massachusetts was too demanding of my time. I tried to be a trader of the financial markets, but no matter how much I learned, my knowledge of the markets and how they worked didn't enable me to make enough money to pay expenses and make a profit. I was too undercapitalized, and it was all very frustrating. A welcome breakthrough came in the form of meditation. I got to the point where I could shut off all interfering thoughts and achieve absolute stillness. With a quiet mind, I sometimes felt as if I were getting in touch with something deeper, that vast collective unconscious that's underneath the surface, just as most of an iceberg is underneath the surface of the ocean. The magnitude of these experiences was far greater than I would have ever expected. It was as if I were connecting with something huge and amazing. I didn't completely understand it, but I did experience it. I was onto something, and practiced every day. My meditation always provided a welcome break from the rest of my life, which was in turmoil. After a while, I realized that I didn't really like Maine and its hard, cold winters. I was a city boy. Sometimes I'd ask, what am I doing here? I didn't know that Maine was exactly the right place for me to be in order to facilitate what was to come. There was a great deal of financial stress during those first three years. My wife and I sometimes argued loudly. This was a bizarre counterpart to the quiet of my meditation. Nobody in the world could push my buttons in the way she could. Sometimes I was ready to say the hell with everything and go sleep on a beach in Hawaii. My life hadn't sucked this much since the 70s, yet there was an underlying feeling that kept me going. I couldn't confirm it with any evidence, but there was a thought that kept coming to my mind, the thought that this was all for a reason. By the autumn of 1992, all of my spiritual learning of the previous 14 years came to a head. I had come to the conclusion that the only viable thing for me to do was to remove conflict from my life. Any drunk who's ever been face down in the gutter and survived has said in some form to himself, there's got to be a better way. At the end of 1992, after three years in Maine, 
Arden and Persa made their first appearance before me. Within a couple of weeks, I began to realize that yes, I had come to Maine for a reason. As time went on, I couldn't see how the events that transpired could have possibly happened for me anywhere else. There's no such thing as an accident, and what was to occur the rest of the decade and beyond gave me an appreciation for the fact that when things don't look the way I expect them to, it's time to stop questioning and start trusting. In April of 2004, I made my second trip of the year to California. I visited both the San Francisco area and the southern part of the state. One day I was staying at the Hyatt on Sunset Strip in Hollywood when I was about to get in the elevator and go to the top of the building where the swimming pool was and take in the view. Suddenly four people came over. One of them, a woman, got in front of me and said, You don't mind waiting for the next elevator, do you? I was surprised but then I looked over and saw that one of the individuals was none other than Little Richard, the iconic rock star. In the ADS, I had played my guitar at over 3,000 gigs, so I had enormous respect for great musicians. I said to the woman, sure, go ahead. I understood that it was her job to keep him from having to deal with fans and photographers, and I was happy to let them use the elevator first. Then something very cool happened. Seeing that I was letting him go first, little Richard came over to me and said, Is this okay with you? I said, No problem. It's good to see you. Then little Richard, a legend to anyone who knows the history of rock and roll, looked me right in the eyes and said, It's good to see you, too. As he got in the elevator, I thought, Wow. This is the guy whose voice Paul McCartney imitated on Long Tall Sally saying it's good to see me, too. It was a fun moment for me, and I soon thought of it as being a holy encounter. Also, when I got home, I made it a point to rent and watch a movie I had seen once before called Down and Out in Beverly Hills, in which Little Richard was excellent as the rock star neighbor. At the end of April, it was time for Arton and Persa's next promised visit. I knew that they wouldn't miss their appointment. Persa, hey, teacher of God. What have you been up to? Gary, oh, you know, the usual, heal a few sick, raise a few dead. Persa, how'd you like California? Gary, I loved it. As I'm sure you know, I saw a lot more of it this time. It was great. Persa, good. You'll be going there many times. Enjoy. Arden, we're going to stick to basics this visit because we want you to always be clear about where you should be coming from. For example, the introduction to a course in miracles says, nothing real can be threatened. What would you say that means? Gary, well, what's real is spirit and spirit would be synonymous with God and Christ. In heaven, there's no difference between you and God. We only need words as long as we think we're here to eventually lead us beyond all words. That being understood, spirit such as God would be immortal, invulnerable, and something that can't be threatened in any way by this world. It would be eternal and changeless, because it's perfect. It's something that literally can't be touched by anything in this world. That's our reality, and our reality is beyond anything that can be threatened. We can experience that reality even when we still appear to be here. Persa, okay. That same intro says, nothing unreal exists. What do you say? Gary, that would be anything that isn't changeless, perfect, immortal, and invulnerable. Obviously the body would fall into that category. All those bodies I see out there don't really exist. That's because they're a product of my mind. It's only in my attitude that those bodies don't exist that I can experience that my body doesn't exist, and that what I really am is that which can't be threatened in any way. Arden, pretty smooth. 
You've been doing really well on the road, by the way. I couldn't have done any better myself. Well, yes, I could, but I'm trying to make you feel good. Gary, funny, you least famous of the disciples. I am having a good time traveling, though. I feel like Dan Aykroyd in that Blues Brothers movie. I'm on a mission from God. Arden, excellent, just as long as you remember not to take it too seriously. Persa, the next line in that course introduction is, herein lies the peace of God. That's self-explanatory. The reason we bring up the intro is to stress the fact that when we're talking about forgiveness, we're talking about a choice. The choice is, what are you? Are you something separate from God? Are you an individual? Are you living in this world, really? Are you mortal? Are you a body? Or are you spirit, one with your source, changeless and eternal, immortal and totally invulnerable? If you are the latter, then there's nothing to forgive. Only a body has grievances to forgive. So forgiveness is a choice of what you want to believe yourself to be by choosing what the other person is. The Course puts it this way, what is in him is changeless, and your changelessness is recognized in its acknowledgement. The holiness in you belongs to him. And by your seeing it in him, returns to you. The ego, the part of your mind that wants to be special and have an individual identity, wants you to see others as separate bodies in order to perpetuate itself. The ego is not you, but as long as you see your brothers and sisters as bodies rather than perfect spirit, you are playing into the ego's desire to have you choose its thought system. As the Course also says, you who believe it easier to see your brother's body than his holiness, be sure you understand what made this judgment. What made it was the ego and the Holy Spirit is now trying to get the part of your mind that chose the ego to choose once again. Choose once again what you would have him be, remembering that every choice you make establishes your own identity as you will see it and believe it is. Gary, I hear you loud and clear, yet that's easier said than done. Arden, few have ever gotten to the point where they did it consistently through the discipline of a trained mind up to and including forgiving the death of their body. That's why Nietzsche said, there was only one Christian, and he died on the cross. The key is mind training. How many people in the world really have a mind that is trained to think right-minded ideas? You'd have to meet thousands of people to find one. Because of Buddhism and the dissemination of A Course in Miracles, there are actually more of them now than at any point in history, but there are also more people. That brings up the importance of doing the workbook of the Course. The Course itself says that it's doing the exercises in the workbook that makes the goal of the Course possible. The mind will go to such lengths to avoid what the Course is saying and delay the clarification of it that people will read the text and interpret it, usually incorrectly. They'll ignore the definitive statements of the Course, which we'll talk more about later and start nitpicking and focusing on individual words or phrases that when taken out of context seem to support their interpretation. Yet everything the Course says must be put within the context of the Course's larger teaching, which shows up unmistakably in those definitive statements. Doing the workbook helps the student focus on applying the larger teaching of the Course rather than giving in to the temptation to see the trees instead of the forest. It trains the mind to think along the lines of the theory that is really set forth in the text. If people read the text of the Course without doing the workbook, then they have not done the Course. It's that simple. The Course itself says so. In the Manual for Teachers, Jay is talking about how much quiet time a teacher should spend with God at the beginning of the day, then he says, this must depend on the teacher of God himself. He cannot claim that title until he has gone through the workbook, since we are learning within the framework of our course. Gary, boy, I forgot about that. I did the workbook, but only once. That's enough, right? 
Persa, yes, absolutely. You did all of the lessons and didn't do more than one lesson per day. Those are the only rules. I happen to know that you'll do the workbook a second time, but for the most part all you need to do is read it once in a while after you've done it. It's always good to read the different parts of the course as a refresher. That prevents the ego from bouncing back, which it will surely do without vigilance on your part. Arden, remember that what is immortal is permanent, and what is mortal is impermanent. The reason we talk about the disappearance of the universe is because when you wake up from a dream, the dream disappears. That's only possible because it was never real in the first place. Some people will think that means they're giving something up. Gary, just the universe. Arden, not the real universe. It's what you awaken to that matters. The universe of time and space was impermanent. What you awaken to is permanent. Your immortal reality is something that's constant. It never shifts or wavers. What people need to get is how much better their real life is than the one they thought was their life. Gary, well, according to what you've said, every time I choose to see people the way the Holy Spirit would have me see them instead of the way the ego wants me to see them is a step home. Arden, yes. Think of the Hindu analogy of undoing the ego. It's like peeling an onion. To adapt that analogy for our purposes, let's say you forgive someone, in the coarsest sense of the word. It's like peeling away a layer of an onion, or in this case, a layer of the ego. Maybe it will look to you like nothing's happened. Why? When you peel away the layer of an onion, it still looks like an onion. It still looks the same. But it's not really the same, because a layer of it has been peeled away. Now, let's say you have perseverance. Maybe you occasionally have experiences of being very peaceful that encourage you. Or maybe something happens that would have made you feel bad in the past, and this time it doesn't make you feel bad. You realize that it's because you've been practicing forgiveness, and that the Holy Spirit is healing your mind at the level of the unconscious. So you keep going and you forgive again and again. What happens is another layer of the onion is peeled away. It may still look the same. So you go in the bathroom and you look in the mirror and you think it's the same old you, but it's not. Maybe you're watching TV and you forgive a news story that you see. Another layer of the onion is peeled away but you think nothing's happening. In the meantime, the Holy Spirit is shining your forgiveness everywhere throughout the mind that is projecting the universe, and thus through the projection as well. It cuts through unconscious guilt and its projections of karma like a laser beam. It goes through all of your past lives, all of your future lives, all through the different dimensions of time, everywhere in the universe of energy and form and through every parallel universe that appears to exist. Incredible things are happening. The Holy Spirit is actually collapsing time as you sit there. Because of your practice of forgiveness, there are lessons that you no longer need to learn, and the Holy Spirit is actually erasing the tapes, taking dimensions of time that held lessons you would have needed to learn if you didn't practice forgiveness, and making those dimensions disappear. And because you can't see everything that the Holy Spirit can see, you're sitting there thinking, this is boring. Nothing's happening. But something amazing is happening. More layers of the onion have been peeled away, and your ego is vanishing. If you persevere and continue to practice forgiveness, then at some point you get down to the final layer of the onion. When you peel away that layer of the onion, then there's nothing left. The onion is gone. And that's the way it is with the ego. After your final forgiveness lesson, the ego is gone, it's been undone, and there's nothing left to interfere with your experience of what you are. There's no reason for you to reincarnate. Practicing forgiveness the way that we will continue to instruct you is how to break the cycle of birth and death. Gary, 
which ties in with that other part of the introduction, where it talks about removing the blocks to the awareness of love's presence. Persa, you got it. That's exactly what happens when you choose the Holy Spirit instead of the ego. Every act of forgiveness undoes the ego, and the Holy Spirit removes the blocks to the awareness of God, or Spirit's presence. The blocks are those walls of guilt in the mind that keep you from your awareness of what you really are. Gary, I've been using that introduction before I go out to give my workshops. I join with Jay, and I say, I am what you are. Nothing real can be threatened. That spirit, which is what I really am. Nothing unreal exists. That would include all those bodies out there that I think I'm going to speak to. And if it includes those bodies, then it includes my body, too. And if I'm not a body, then I don't have anything to defend and nothing to worry about. I do that every time. Persa, very good. I also like it when you use that section from early in the course about being there to be truly helpful. That invites the Holy Spirit to be in charge of the whole day, and it works very well. Gary, hey, you've been watching. Persa, why don't you recite it now? Jay gave it to Helen early in the scribing of the course, but it was really meant for Bill at first. Of course, ultimately it was meant for everyone. But Bill had to get up and give this talk to a group of psychiatrists at Princeton, and he wasn't the kind of a person who would normally get up and speak. He was a lot like you, he was very introverted, which most mystical people are. They're used to going within, not being out there. So when Bill thought of J.S. words, it relaxed him, because he knew that the Holy Spirit was right there taking over. Gary. Okay. It goes something like this. Actually it goes exactly like this. I am here only to be truly helpful. I am here to represent him who sent me. I do not have to worry about what to say or what to do, because he who sent me will direct me. I am content to be wherever he wishes, knowing he goes there with me. I will be healed as I let him teach me to heal. Arden. So let's add the third way to be inspired, or in spirit. You join with the Holy Spirit. It's as simple as that. By putting spirit in charge, you are absolved of any responsibility and any guilt. Now it's the Holy Spirit's responsibility, which is also true of your books. Of course, the more you do your forgiveness homework, the more free your mind will become from the blocks to hearing spirit. And the more you practice joining with God in the silent form of true prayer we talked about, the more clear you will be to listen to spirit. Then, finally, there's the third method, which is the conscious act of joining with spirit whenever it's appropriate in order to help yourself or others in a situation that calls for it. Remember this, also, the Holy Spirit will not always show up to you as a voice. The Holy Spirit can show up in the form of intuition, an idea, or a feeling and can speak through another person you are listening to, and suddenly you may realize that what you are hearing is a good idea. Spirit can teach you in your dreams. There are numerous ways for the Holy Spirit to show up for you. Always be open to that. Gary, ah, uh, yeah. I think I'm kind of open to that. Am I wrong? Or did you guys just pop up out of nowhere? Hey! Do you remember the first time you ever appeared to me? I didn't know what the hell to think. Persa, yes, but we knew you were ready for it. Gary, both of you looked so peaceful, so it was reassuring, and the way you talked, well, I just kind of fell into it. What's strange is how normal it seemed. I'd get to talking to you and forget about the circumstances for a minute or two, and then all of a sudden I'd think, Jesus Christ, these people just materialized out of thin air. Then it would seem strange. Then you'd say something, and I'd start talking to you again, and it would seem normal. So we'd keep going for a while, 
and then all of a sudden I'd think, Jesus Christ, these people just materialized out of thin air. It was wild. Arden, maybe so, but the fact that we're appearing to you now is no more strange than the fact that you think you're appearing here right now. The appearance of our bodies is not happening in the way you're used to, but it's still no stranger than the appearance of other people's bodies. The main difference is that unlike other bodies, which are projected as a result of the thought of separation, our bodies are projected by the right part of the mind, where the Holy Spirit dwells. The purpose of them is to teach, in a way you can understand, that all separation is unreal. That doesn't mean that the Holy Spirit is projecting these bodies. It's the love of the Holy Spirit that is behind the appearances. Then it's the right part of the mind that gives form to that love. That's also true of the Holy Spirit's voice. He may sound to you like some guy who speaks English. But the Holy Spirit is not some guy who speaks English. The love behind the voice is the Holy Spirit's, but the form of it comes from the right-minded part of the split mind. Speaking of the right part of the mind, we're going to give you two forgiveness thought processes that we want you to practice. We want you to use one of them on yourself, and the other one should be used to practice on the bodies that you see as being outside of you. They're really all the same, but we're giving you this idea so that you'll have someone to practice on when there's nobody else around. When you're alone, you can think of yourself while you say this first one. Or maybe when you're looking in the mirror. That would be a great time for you to say these words. Repeat after me. I am immortal spirit. This body is just an image. It has nothing to do with what I am. Gary, I am immortal spirit. This body is just an image. It has nothing to do with what I am. All right. I'll try it. Arden. Good. You're a typical person in the sense that you have a tendency to project your unconscious guilt onto other people and make them wrong. But everybody has times when they blame themselves. This is for those times. When you're beating yourself up, remember this forgiveness thought process. Now, this will be especially useful for those who have a habit of blaming themselves. There are people who project their unconscious guilt onto their own body instead of others. That brings up a disturbing subject. Suicide is the biggest problem in the world that the world is in total denial of. Suicide is the biggest problem in the world that the world is in total denial of. It's the dirty little secret of the ego. Sure, people know about suicide, but they have no idea how widespread it is. More people die from suicide than are killed by all of the wars and all of the crime in the world combined. As just one example, more firefighters die from suicide than are ever killed in fires. Nobody wants to talk about it. Nobody wants to examine it. If someone is depressed, the system will put them on drugs and never look at the reasons. That's because the ego doesn't want to look at the issue of unconscious guilt which is the real cause of suicide. The ego runs away from looking at it as fast as possible. In Japan, there are groups of teenagers who meet on the internet, go out in vans, and kill themselves together. That has also spread a little bit to Europe. I suppose you can imagine how parents in America would react to that kind of a situation. Gary, yeah. First they'd freak out then they'd put more people on drugs. It's amazing how Americans don't have any problem with drugs as long as the right people are making money from them. The corporations and the government they run have everybody brainwashed. But I digress. Persa, remember, some of these drugs are necessary as a temporary measure for people. Not many can tolerate being healed all at once. That could be too threatening to their ego. Then feeling threatened, the ego could go ballistic and find another way to hurt them, perhaps a worse way. Don't forget that the nature of duality is that you have good and bad. Yes, 
the corporations have people brainwashed. People vote against themselves in your country. But at the same time there are a lot of new medicines that help people, especially older people, to not suffer the way they used to. Your parents could have used some of the medicines they have today. Their lives would have been more comfortable and less painful. They weren't quite ready to accept that it's all done by the mind. Don't just look for the bad. You don't want to be cynical. You want to be love. Gary, okay, beautiful. I can take a hint. Persa, the long-term cure for all of this is forgiveness. As we've pointed out before, and this is very important, the Course says, atonement does not heal the sick, for that is not a cure. It takes away the guilt that makes the sickness possible. And that is cure indeed. Gary, it seems that you hear about suicides, but then that's it. There's no more discussion about it. Persa, yes. Given that the Course is the only teaching that not only addresses but completely explains the issue of unconscious guilt, it shows you how vital it is to make this teaching more available to people. Right now most of the people who teach it don't even understand it. And the ones who quote from it without teaching it certainly don't understand it. They take lines from it out of context to support what they're teaching. But what the Course is teaching is that you can undo the ego that's in your mind, have the Holy Spirit heal all of your unconscious guilt, and be free. The fastest way to do that is to change the way you look at other people, events, and situations. It also teaches you how to do that. Be grateful that you are one of the people who is privileged to spread this message. But don't stop there. The most important part of the Course isn't what it means. The most important part of doing the Course is applying it to your life. Arden, that brings up the second forgiveness thought process we want you to do, and of course also share with others. This is how you should always think of another person. Memorize it and say it in your mind to others when it's appropriate. Obviously there will be times when you're carrying on a conversation with someone. Don't stop and think of this and then say it to them in your mind. Carry on a normal conversation. Always be appropriate. Don't be weird. When you don't have to talk, and you have a chance to send these words in your mind to another mind, think of the following. Repeat after me. You are spirit. Whole and innocent. All is forgiven and released. Gary, you are spirit. Whole and innocent. All is forgiven and released. Cool. Arden, yes, very cool. I used to say something very similar to my patients in my final lifetime. Saying those words in your mind to another is a way to have it be true about yourself in your own unconscious mind and it allows the Holy Spirit to heal and release the unconscious guilt that binds you to the universe of form. The secret of reawakening to your immortality is in mastering not the things of this world, but the way you look at this world. Let me give you an example. There are some people who have been studying a course in miracles for a long time who consider themselves to be very intelligent. They think they know what the course means. In some cases, Maybe they do, and in other cases, maybe they don't. Yet what's important is that you take your understanding of the Course, whatever it is, and apply it. The intellectual who uses his understanding of the Course to prove himself to be intellectually superior to others isn't really doing the Course. I would contend to you that a person whom the world would judge as being mentally challenged, someone who has very little intelligence, who is going through life seeing people with love and non-judgment, is making more spiritual progress in this lifetime than the intellectual who goes through life making himself right and others wrong about what a Course in Miracles means. To repeat, it's not about impressing the world, it's about how you look at it. Mother Teresa was an excellent example. She looked at everybody with love and forgiveness. Ultimately, it didn't matter what her theology was. 
Most of the people she ministered to throughout her life weren't even members of her own religion. That didn't matter to her. She saw everyone as being completely worthy of God's love, without exception. Her love and forgiveness were not withheld from anyone. It was total and universal. She judged and condemned no one. So her mind was completely healed by the Holy Spirit. She became enlightened and broke the cycle of birth and death. Gary, excellent. So she doesn't have to come back, hey? Arden, that's correct. Gary, that would confirm that it's not the theology, but what you do. With it. And you know, there's a school of thought that says Jay had to put the course the way he did or else the intellectuals wouldn't have taken it seriously. If you give them something simple, they don't respect it. So he spelled it out with this lengthy intellectual, biblical, and scholarly presentation so it would be impressive enough for them to want to listen to it. Arden, there's some truth to that, but it's not that simple. That's because, as we've said, the ego isn't simple. So it still takes a lot of work to undo the ego. And another reason for the course's length and style is that it helps facilitate that. What is simple is that there are always really only two things to choose between, and only one of them is the truth. Gary, you know some people might say that it's not very loving for God to let us dream a dream like this that always turns into a nightmare eventually. What would you say to that? Arden? It's always amusing that those same people then want to turn around and say that God created the world. Talk about God not being loving. In answer to your question, God is not letting you dream this. In order to let you, he'd have to acknowledge a separation idea in the first place. We've already said that he doesn't. It's only because he doesn't that there is still perfect oneness for you to wake up to. Gary. Well, there are people who think that God couldn't experience himself in oneness, and the only way he could experience himself was to make this world and live in it. A lot of them seem to listen to authors and teachers who say so, like the Conversations with God books. Persa, if they look deeper, they'd realize that they're regarding God as insane. You've had the mystical experience of what it's like to be with God in heaven, right? Gary, yeah. Persa, and how does heaven compare to this world? Gary, there is no comparison. In heaven, you are God. Persa, but it's an experience, like an awareness, isn't it? Gary, it sure is. It's a far greater experience than anything this world has to offer. Persa, all right, then. The idea of thinking that God would have to make this world in order to experience duality so he could appreciate and enjoy himself is the equivalent of the idea that in order to experience and enjoy sex, you would have to also experience getting shot in the gut. No. Pain is the result of the guilt that came from thinking you separated yourself from God, and you don't have to experience pain in order to experience the pleasure of reality. But you do have to forgive pain and suffering and give it up in order to return to reality. Jay couldn't be any more clear about that in his course, and he is the one you should listen to. From the ego came sin and guilt and death, in opposition to life and innocence, and to the will of God himself. Where can such opposition lie but in the sick minds of the insane, dedicated to madness and set against the peace of heaven? One thing is sure. God, who created neither sin nor death, wills not that you be bound by them. He knows of neither sin nor its results. The shrouded figures in the funeral procession march not in honor of their Creator, whose will it is they live. They are not following His will, they are opposing it. Gary, boy, he's gonna have to stop holding back and say how he really feels. So here are people saying that God made opposites so he could experience himself, and here's Jay saying that what's all-encompassing can have no opposite, and that only the insane would think either that it could or that it should. Is that a fair statement? Persa, 
Yes. Gary, you know, sometimes people ask me why a course in miracles isn't more popular. Granted, the course isn't obscure, and there are almost two million copies of it out there. But still, compared to some things, it's not that popular. Persa, actually, you're starting to change that, with our help, of course. One of the reasons the course wasn't as popular as other approaches was because no popular teacher ever really explained it to people, so they'd start studying the course and then not being able to understand it, they'd give up in frustration. Now, when they read your books and then go read the course for themselves, they can understand it. Gary, cool, but getting back to what I was saying, when people ask me why the course isn't more popular, I say that given what it's saying, it's a miracle that it's as popular as it is. Persa, that's a good point. Remember, we never said that the course is for everyone, in fact, it's not for everyone. But it is for a lot more people than have studied it so far, and the better people get what it's saying, the more likely they are to stay interested in it. And you have to keep in mind that this is just the beginning. It's always the application that leads to the experience the course is directed toward. Gary, herein lies the peace of God, right? Persa, you've got it, and that peace is an experience. Gary, beautiful. And I take it our review got finished somewhere along the way here? Persa, yes, you can always use a review. In fact, in between bringing in new ideas, the course itself is a constant review. That quote I used a couple of minutes ago echoes the principle taught in the course's introduction that you mentioned, the idea that what's all-encompassing can have no opposite. But it says it in a different way and on a deeper level. That's part of the method Jay uses to undo the ego. Gary, okay, I have a question. Every now and then I read about one of these Nazis who escaped to South America, and there will be a report that the guy died and he was like in his 80s or 90s or something. Now I've been told for the last 25 years that my thinking determines my health. So how come these jerks get to live to be a hundred? I mean, what kind of thoughts must they have been having most of their lives? Arden, get a grip, Gary. Your thoughts determine your experience of life, not what happens in your life. What happens on the level of form, how long you live, how rich or poor you are, whether or not you are faced with the challenge of heart disease, stroke, cancer, or what have you, was all determined before you ever appeared to be born. The instant you chose the ego on that metaphysical level, everything else was a done deal. That's why life here isn't fair. And don't ask why you should even bother. I just said you do determine your experience with your thoughts, and your experience is what's important. The only real power you have here is the power to choose between the ego and the Holy Spirit. In the process, if you happen to change dimensions of time through the Holy Spirit's collapsing of time and thus have a different scenario play itself out within the fixed script, then you should consider that to be a fringe benefit. That's not what the Course is about though. As for the collapsing of time, remember that only the Holy Spirit knows what's best for everyone. Put him in charge of time and space. Put the one in charge who knows everything. If you're sick and your symptoms change through choosing forgiveness, then consider that to be a fringe benefit, also. The real goal is heaven, but the short-term goal is peace, and the end of all pain and suffering. It's absolutely within your means to learn to end all pain and suffering, despite anything that appears to be happening in the world and regardless of what your symptoms appear to be. That's the Holy Spirit's answer to the ego's script of guilt, pain, suffering, and death. The only real power you have here is the power to choose between the ego and the Holy Spirit. Gary, so that Nazi would have lived to be 90, anyway but the quality of his life and how he experiences those 90 years is determined by his thoughts, 
and that also goes for his spiritual progress and how many more lifetimes he has to come back for. Arden, exactly. Excellent. Now, it's just about time for us to take off. Be especially vigilant this next road trip, dear brother. You'll see why I said that. But have a good time, too. Gary, thanks. I'm doing my best. Persa, we know, and that's all anyone can ask, teacher of God. Remember the two forgiveness thought processes we gave you. And, sometime, when you're on a long plane trip and you're trying to take a nap but can't fall asleep because of turbulence or some other reason, think of these words from the Course. Then as you take your respite from the ways of earth, you'll be reminded of the awesome truth that is within you, the Son of Life cannot be killed. He is immortal as his Father. What he is cannot be changed. About three weeks later, I was returning from a trip to the Midwest, flying into Portland, Maine. I heard a loud bang on the right side of the aircraft and saw what appeared to be a flash of fire go by the window. The flight attendant went running down the aisle toward the flight deck. The people on the plane, about 60 of them, became very quiet, wondering if something dreadful had happened to the plane's ability to function. I was nervous. I thought, damn it. Just when things were going so well. Then I remembered what Persa had said just before she and Artin disappeared, and I repeated the words from the course she'd told me to. I thought of the immortal nature of what I really am, and asked Jade to be with me and help me to see this situation differently. I felt better immediately, even though I still didn't know what was going on. It didn't take long to find out. After what was probably no more than a minute, the flight attendant came on the intercom and said, It's all right, folks. The plane was struck by lightning, but everything checks out okay. All I said was thank you, and then I took a short nap while the pilot made his final approach into Portland. Murders without corpses. Attack in any form is equally destructive. Its purpose does not change. Its sole intent is murder, and what form of murder serves to cover the massive guilt and frantic fear of punishment the murderer must feel. He may deny he is a murderer and justify his savagery with smiles as he attacks. Yet he will suffer, and will look on his intent in nightmares where the smiles are gone, and where the purpose rises to meet his horrified awareness and pursue him still. For no one thinks of murder and escapes the guilt the thought entails. If the intent is death, what matter the form it takes? On that same trip to the Midwest, I went to Wisconsin, where my friend Linda had arranged a workshop for me in Wisconsin Dells. It was a couple of miles down the road from a cult that uses a course in miracles for its own purposes. In fact, the leader of the cult refers to himself, incredibly, as the master teacher of a course in miracles. Hearing that I was doing a workshop near there, one of the teacher's cronies had invited me to visit. As Linda and I entered Endeavor Academy, I had no doubt that it must be helpful to some of the people who were there. If they want to live or study somewhere, then there must be a reason that they believe serves them. What I found was an atmosphere that was highly unusual, especially compared to what one would expect from followers of a self-study course. There was a room on the side where someone was reading the workbook lesson for that day. There were around 40 people listening, and they would laugh at inappropriate times. Yes, the course encourages laughter, but these people were laughing at serious lines they should have been thinking about and getting on a deeper level. It was as if they knew some funny meaning to the words that their thought system alone was privy to. What they were actually doing was ignoring the real meaning of the lines as a way of denying the course's message. Then the master teacher made his entrance down the stairway, and the crowd gathered around him. They followed him, as did I, into a larger room for what they called session. The man spoke for about an hour. 
No one else was allowed to talk or ask questions. Because in the previous year the reading and sharing of my first book at the academy had apparently contributed to a large number of people there finding out what the course actually meant and then leaving, the man came up to me several times during the hour and confronted me, at one point bumping me and slapping me on the head. As he walked away from one of his confrontations, he called me a dumb shit. I tried to look up this particular teaching style later in the manual for teachers of the course, but I couldn't find it anywhere. Through all of this, I didn't react to him, practicing the kind of forgiveness that's taught in the course. My teachers had given me a heads up that I would need to practice forgiveness in such situations. I thought of this man as being a projection I'd made up so that I could see what I secretly believed to be true about myself outside of me instead of on the inside. This reminded me that he wasn't really there, and so there wasn't really anyone to react to. An element of this is the knowing that only God is real and anything that is not of God cannot affect me. I then released him to the Holy Spirit in peace. At one point, the so-called master teacher appeared frustrated by my refusal to be rattled by him and exclaimed, Look at him, he's smiling. While I was there, I saw members of the group manipulated and pitted against each other. People were intimidated and verbally abused. Although this man was literally teaching a form of gibberish that had nothing to do with the course, some of the participants were acting as though they understood it at the same time turning him into their special teacher instead of listening to what the voice of the Course was actually communicating. If you didn't understand what the Master Teacher was saying, and there was no reason why you should, then you'd be labeled as one of the dead ones. If you went along with him, you'd fit right in. It was a classic cult atmosphere. Who doesn't want to fit in? This teacher also mixed in parts of the Bible that weren't saying the same thing as the Course. He exhorted the virtue of light bodies and encouraged his followers to flip out on Kundalini energy, apparently oblivious to the fact that according to the Course, energy is nothing but illusion and is not to be valued. By definition, anything that can change or be changed is not real. In any case, the goal of the Course is the peace of God not getting high on the ego's miscreations. I stayed for an hour, listened, and forgave. Then the teacher put on a video of himself, and Linda and I left. I also visited the healing center, which the cult has many branches of. In fact, they present themselves to most of the world through their more sane-looking healing centers as a way of inducing people to join. The next day I did my workshop at a large hotel down the road. Many former members of the cult came who still resided in the area, as well as some who lived quite a distance away and traveled to be there. Twenty current members also came over from the academy, without permission. Many of the former members of the cult, who are spread out all over the country, have a bond with each other and stay in touch. It was a pleasure to feel the love in the room and also share the message with them. One of my favorite parts of each workshop is the question and answer session, where I interact with the audience. But that's not the only time I interact with them. I like to meet people and talk with them all day, from the time I arrive until the time I leave, during my breaks, lunch, or whenever I have the chance. I also like to sign books. It makes me feel like an author. The day after that, I found myself in the rural town of Kiel, Wisconsin, not far from Green Bay, to do another workshop, this time at a different A course in Miracles teaching facility called Pathways of Light. In the two days I spent there, I was struck by the similarity in approaches between the directors of the organization, Robert and Mary Stolting, and what I had heard about the course's scribe. Helen's Cookman. When word had gotten out in the 70s that Helen was hearing the voice of Jesus, people would occasionally try to get her to ask him a question for them. Instead of doing that, Helen would sit down with them and ask them to listen with her. As an alternative to having them rely on her to hear the voice for God, 
Helen's idea was to empower them to hear the voice for themselves. I found that this was also the approach at Pathways of Light. Instead of telling people what to do, they were into teaching people how to hear the Holy Spirit's voice for themselves so they could be guided by spirit without needing another human to mediate for them. It's also wise to remember that the voice can actually show up in many different forms, not just as a voice. Of course, the best and fastest approach to making that happen in a permanent way is through the process of forgiveness, which undoes the blocks in people's minds to hearing that voice. It's also wise to remember that the voice can actually show up in many different forms, not just as a voice. I liked the Stoltings very much, and I looked forward to returning to Pathways of Light. I was speaking someplace different in the country almost every week now, and a month later, in May of 2004, I made my first trip to Canada to do an appearance in Halifax, Nova Scotia. As a way of illustrating how little traveling I had done before the book came out, I had lived in New England all of my life and had never been to Canada. I loved the people in Halifax. After the workshop, they had a celebration with music, drinking, and dancing. I found it refreshing that they didn't think being spiritual and having a good time were mutually exclusive. While I was in Halifax I received the exciting news that Hay House, one of the most prominent self-help slash spiritual publishers in the world, was interested in taking over the publication of The Disappearance of the Universe. Although I knew I'd have to talk about it with my original publisher, D. Patrick Miller of Fearless Books, I sensed that it was meant to happen, and I couldn't wait to acknowledge Arden and Persa for their plan for the book. It suddenly dawned on me that they knew what they were doing all along and that the path they had chosen was to have the book prove itself first through sales, which would enable it to find its way to a bigger publisher and a worldwide audience without the message in it ever being changed. A couple of weeks later, Patrick and I were in Chicago to meet with Hay House at Book Expo America. It was an exciting event, and Bill Clinton gave the keynote speech. We came to an agreement with Hay House and Patrick and I went out to dinner that night to celebrate. The next day I was due to fly to New Jersey for a workshop. It was a beautiful, cloudless day as the plane took off and flew past the Sears Tower and out over Lake Michigan. The view was amazing. When we got to Newark, we flew down past the Statue of Liberty, and I could clearly see Manhattan with the legendary Empire State Building dominating the skyline. Suddenly I thought, my God, I'm getting paid for this. It was then that I realized, in a good way, that my life was never going to be the same. I was overwhelmed with gratitude. At the end of June, I had plenty to discuss with my ascended mentors. Arden and Persa appeared and looked at me with their kind expressions and loving eyes. I expected them because I knew they were coming every two months, and when the time for their appearances drew near, I'd point my chair away from the television, which I found myself watching less and less the more I traveled, and toward the couch where they were scheduled to show up. Arden spoke first. Arden, hey, buddy. How was the game? Note, I had been to a baseball game at Fenway Park the week before on June 22. I had gone with a friend of mine from Naples, Maine, who treated me to the best seat I had ever sat in at a Red Sox game, just a few rows behind their dugout. Gary, it was great. I must have been to Fenway a hundred times, but those seats were awesome. Kurt Schilling pitched, they won the game, and I even got to see Nomar hit a grand slam. Note. Red Sox shortstop Nomar Garcia Para was traded to the Chicago Cubs later in the season, which at the time outraged what we New Englanders call Red Sox Nation. Gary, and you know, I can't recall the Sox ever having pitching this good. Am I drunk, or could they go all the way this year? Arden, well, you're not drunk. Gary, all right. I guess you wouldn't tell me something like that. 
but I have a feeling about it. I mean, if the Patriots can win these Super Bowls after coming up empty for 40 years, then anything can happen, right? Arden, I can't argue with that. You've had developments outside the world of sports as well? Gary, oh yeah. The book's doing really well. Every month it does better than the month before. And I've been all over the place. Aside from spreading the word about the course, I'm also using my traveling and speaking for what you said, forgiveness at least when I remember. California was amazing, and that visit to Wisconsin was really good, except the session was a little hairy with that teacher you gave me the heads up about. I did my job, though. The ARE is really coming through, too. That's a breakthrough in many ways. Note, at one time a course in miracles had been welcome at the Edgar Casey Group in Virginia Beach, the Association for Research and Enlightenment, ARE. Hugh Lynn Casey's friendship with Helen Scookman and Bill Thetford helped get the course off on the right foot there. In the previous ten years, however, the course had fallen out of favor, as some students of the Casey readings interpreted the course as not always saying the same things as Casey. They didn't want the course at the ARE, and it hadn't been taught there in a long time. When the disappearance of the universe came out, it caught on quickly before these people got wind of the fact that it was about the course, partly because disappearance doesn't mention the course on the cover. Before long, disappearance was the number one book at the ARE, and the organization took that as a signal that maybe they should be more open to the course. I was invited to do an all-day workshop. I went in March for the first time and was very well received. This led to a new beginning for the course at the ARE, and after that it was welcomed and studied by a lot of the members for the first time in many years. The inclusion of disappearance in the organization's catalog, which went out to 200,000 people, and an excellent review of the book in their magazine, Venture Inward, didn't hurt either. Arden, excellent, and we saw your forgiveness process with that teacher in Wisconsin. Keep it up, wherever you go. Incidentally, you may sometimes find that it's harder to forgive on the internet than in person. That's because a lot of people have a tendency to speak more freely there, and they'll sometimes say things about you online that they would never say to someone in person. Once you hit that send button, you can't cancel a message. And it won't just be hard to forgive someone who condemns you. You'll have to be careful about not doing it to others. Judging and condemning someone else on the internet, which of course is the projection of unconscious guilt, is a temptation for everyone nowadays. Gary, I know. The internet tends to bring out the worst in me. Not too often, but once in a while. Like I haven't been very appreciative of that woman who screwed over our book. Note, Disappearance was quickly becoming the most talked about, widely read, and critically acclaimed book about the course in over a decade, yet the biggest organization within the course community that carried other people's books, called Miracle Distribution Center, refused to even sell it. I couldn't believe it. Why not at least let the students decide for themselves what they want to read? The woman who founded this organization chose instead to attempt to prevent distribution of the book within the course community. No viable reason was offered, and given the success of the book, course politics had to be the reason. The problem was compounded by the fact that the woman who refused to sell the book had lied to my publisher and me saying that the reason for not selling it was that the book just didn't speak to any of us here. I later learned that the person who reviews books for this organization had given disappearance an enthusiastic thumbs up, and that his recommendation had been overruled by this woman. I also received evidence that she was working to help another course author with a point of view different from what was expressed in my book, and any excuse not to carry disappearance would do including the fact that much of the information in it had come from Ascended Masters. This from a seller of books about a course that was channeled through a woman by Jesus. 
Disappearance was specifically about Jay and his course, and rapidly increasing numbers of students were saying that it genuinely clarified a course in miracles and caused it to make sense to them for the first time ever. Many others were being introduced to it. The reinvigoration of energy and new excitement about the course was undeniable. This woman sold hundreds of books by other authors that didn't have any quotations from A Course in Miracles in them, and mine included hundreds of quotes from the course. It was the first time in many years that any book had done so with the permission of the publishers of the course. She also presented herself to the public as a clearinghouse for books about the course, and she raised funds from those who thought they were giving money to support the course. In fact, she openly encouraged them to leave money to her organization in their wills. And here she was, deliberately excluding a book that many people were learning about the course from for the first time. Later, when some of those same individuals inevitably became customers of hers, she would also try to hit them up for money. I considered that to be unethical. This was a classic forgiveness opportunity for me, but one I didn't accept easily. It wasn't that this woman's actions were hurting the success of the book. People simply bought it somewhere else, including members of her own staff. To not support a book is one thing. She could have offered the book for sale without supporting or advertising it. But to attempt to suppress it by not selling it at all was another thing. Disappearance was obviously the most visible course book out there and she was obviously the most visible seller of these books. To not even carry it was a public slap in the face. No matter how much it looks like you're right, and on the level of form you're certainly right, it won't bring you. Peace. Persa, Gary, Gary, Gary. You're usually more aware of what's going on than what you're displaying in this situation. Don't you get it? You've been set up. It's a classic case of the ego laying its trap. No matter how much it looks like you're right, and on the level of form you're certainly right, it won't bring you peace. That's why the Course asks, do you prefer that you be right or happy? What's the central thought the Course attempts to teach? Gary, there is no world. Persa, I'm sorry. I didn't quite hear that. Gary, there is no world. Persa, that's right. And it doesn't say, there is no world, yet, but maybe. It says, there is no world. This is the central thought the Course attempts to teach. That's a definitive statement, Gary. We'll talk about definitive statements shortly, but right now, do me a favor. Read that part of the paragraph from the workbook. It's in lesson 132. Read to the word recognize in the next paragraph. You've heard it before, but you'll get it on a deeper level. Gary, all right. Usually when you have me read something from the course, it makes me feel better about a situation. There is no world. This is the central thought the course attempts to teach. Not everyone is ready to accept it, and each one must go as far as he can let himself be led along the road to truth. He will return and go still farther, or perhaps step back a while and then return again. But healing is the gift of those who are prepared to learn there is no world, and can accept the lesson now. Their readiness will bring the lesson to them in some form which they can understand and recognize. Persa, thank you, Gary. Now, you should always remember that whatever appears to happen is just a dream. The reason the Course says that reincarnation isn't true is because it's an illusion. It appears to happen, but you never really go into a body, it just looks that way. It's an optical illusion. Why? Well, for one thing, the Course teaches that the body doesn't even exist. So how could you really be going into one? As the Course says, the body does not exist except as a learning device for the mind. This learning device is not subject to errors if its own, because it cannot create. 
It is obvious, then, that inducing the mind to give up its miscreations is the only application of creative ability that is truly meaningful. Gary, oh, great! The body doesn't exist and can't create, and all the mind can do is choose spirit instead of the ego and its projections, a projection being anything that appears to be separate from anything, and that would include the body, present company excluded, because you come through the right part of the mind, which is extremely rare for bodies. And if I'm hearing that quote right, it's saying that there's nothing meaningful in the concept of being a CO creator with God on the level of the world, because Jay is saying that the only meaningful thing the mind can do that involves any kind of creative ability is give up whatever appears to be separate. That doesn't mean you give it up physically, which would just make it real to the mind, you give it up by not believing in it, and choose perfect spirit as your identity instead. Am I in the ballpark here? Persa, you got it. Gary, wonderful. Do you have anything else that's gonna help us sell a million copies? Persa, that's funny, but on the practical side of things, if you want to make a million dollars, then it's apparent that you should write a book about how to make a million dollars. It won't matter if anybody actually makes a million dollars after they read it. You can just tell them they're not doing it right. But that's not the business we're in. We're in the business of undoing the ego and getting you home. If you want to undo the ego, then let's get down to business. I said you've been set up. We mentioned earlier that you meet people in this lifetime whom you've had dealings with before in other lifetimes, whether through special love or special hate. Of course that's a linear perspective. It actually happened all at once as a hologram and then appears to act itself out in a linear manner. When you meet someone in this lifetime you've known before in other dream lifetimes, it's because you are orbiting each other. Just as planets orbit the sun, move away from each other in their orbits and then, after reaching their farthest point away, come back to their closest point again, people orbit each other in the hologram of time and space in a similar manner. Gary, so opposites really do attract? Persa, yes, but the outcome isn't always pretty, because of the setup. Just as in the case of special love, people whom you've had special hate interests with in the past will come back to the closest point in their orbit with you, and because the unconscious mind has retained the memory of them, you'll have conflict, sometimes right away and sometimes later in the relationship. That shows up as a problem to you, but it's also a marvelous opportunity, if you have the mental discipline to use it. Jay is very eloquent about that when he says, the holiest of all the spots on earth is where an ancient hatred has become a present love. Now, we've never said the course is the only way home. We have implied that it's the fastest, and Jay makes a lot of statements about saving time in the course. Some may scoff at that, but if they do, it's because they don't really get what the Course is saying. Still, the Course isn't the only way, as Jay points out in that quote you just read, their readiness will bring the lesson to them in some form which they can understand and recognize. So it could be something else, like Buddhism, but we'll stick to the method Jay used in his final lifetime and that he's teaching in more detail through the Course, because people are in a position to better understand it now. Maybe there are some people who think there are other teachers in the world today who can get them home faster than Jay can. They are mistaken, but because the course is not for everybody at the same time, then it doesn't really matter. Gary, and that remark, he will return and go still farther, or perhaps step back a while and then return again. Does that mean in between lifetimes you can delay coming back again and hang out in the ether reading the Akashic records and stuff? Arden, something like that. Maybe we'll give you a little tour sometime. But Persa was saying? Persa, that woman you mentioned who you said screwed over our book is a good example of someone coming back into your orbit. You've had lifetimes where you knew each other. You were even married once. 
She died fairly young, and you kind of blamed yourself for her death. Gary, why? Persa, you killed her. Gary, oh. Persa, it's a long story, but needless to say, there's a little unresolved conflict there. Today you have a book that a lot of people are reading, but the second she saw it, her unconscious mind had an aversion to it. The last time, she was the victim and you were the victimizer, but just so you won't feel too bad, you had times before that where you were the victim and she was the victimizer. Of course, you've switched genders at times. And so it goes. This time in your conjunction with her you get to be the victim. Congratulations. The question is, what are you going to use it for this time, freedom or bondage? Are you going to get that you are not a victim and take responsibility for dreaming, or are you going to make it real and stay stuck here? Gary, but it's such a bitch. Not her, the situation. Persa, of course it is, or else it wouldn't be a setup. The two of you were supposed to come into each other's orbit. You can use your relationship for the ego's purposes or the Holy Spirit's. As Jay puts it, those who are to meet will meet, because together they have the potential for a holy relationship. They are ready for each other. Gary, well, we couldn't have been too ready for each other that time I snuffed her. Persa, first of all, she had killed you before that in another dream, so things aren't always as simple as they appear. More important, it's not what you do to each other that matters, it's how you think about each other. What you appear to do is just an effect of what you think. Because what you do is taking place within a dream, that's not the focus of the course. Our focus is on the cause of the dream and undoing it. And if, as Jay also teaches, there are no degrees, aspects, or intervals in reality, and levels only exist in the dream of separation, then that means there are really only two things you can do. Every forgiving thought is an expression of love, every unforgiving thought is a murder. It doesn't matter if there isn't a corpse. Each day the earth turns is a day full of murders without corpses people thinking unforgiving thoughts toward one another. As Jay says in no uncertain terms, what is not love is murder. What is not loving must be an attack. Our focus is on the cause of the dream and undoing it. Gary, so every unloving thought is the same, and how intense it appears to be is insignificant. But every thought of love is also the same. That's why it says right in that first miracles principle, all expressions of love are maximal. Persa, very nice. You know it's true, Gary. But we can't make you practice it. Doing it most of the time isn't enough. Sure, you're better off in many ways, but the only real ticket out of here is through universal application. If you remember it's really your own secret beliefs you have about yourself in your unconscious mind that you chose to see in her as a way of escaping from them, then you can get that you are the one being freed through your forgiveness. As the Course asks, would they be willing to accept the fact their savage purpose is directed against themselves? Gary, I hear you. I'll do my best. I understand what you're saying about why some lessons are harder than others, and I'll try to remember that I set myself up from a higher illusory level. I made that woman up for a reason, and then we act out things here so it can look like my lack of peace is her fault, when the truth is my lack of peace no matter what form it takes, is always a result of my own decision to not forgive. But decisions can be changed. I can recognize the truth, which is that nothing's really happening. It's just a dream, and I'm the one dreamer. It's like the Course says, awareness of dreaming is the real function of God's teachers. Note, I was still a little upset, but I realized that what Persa said was true. Although I'd learned a great deal and often applied it, I didn't do it right away in every situation that came up in my daily life. And if I didn't, then I couldn't complete my lessons. 
I knew even more that if I only forgave partially, then I would be only partially forgiven. If I forgave completely, then I would be completely forgiven. It didn't matter what was being forgiven, and this was true of course politics as well as any other forgiveness opportunity. Persa, excellent. So, we've been serious for too long. Say something funny. Gary, okay. Adam and Eve are lying underneath a tree in the Garden of Eden. Adam looks at Eve and says, You know, I can't help but feel there's a book in this. Persa, cute. And you managed to work in an erotic touch. Gary, well, Persa, speaking of erotic touches, when are you and I gonna hook up? Persa, hum let me see. Does never work for you? Gary, still playing hard to get, hey? Arden, you know, buddy, that is the image of my wife you're talking to there, even if she is you. Gary, sorry, I forgot. It's hard to keep track of everybody. It's a good thing there's really only one of us, hey? Say, Persa, do you remember the last series of visits? when you came once all by yourself. You're not by chance gonna do that again, are you? Persa, are you about ready to proceed? Gary, oh, all right. When you talked about definitive statements in the course, I take it that the idea that there is no world would be one of them, right? Persa, yes. A definitive statement is an idea in the course that's so clear it defines what the course is teaching, and it encapsulates what the course is saying. If there is no world, then there's nothing to forgive, and recognizing that fact in the events, situations, and people you see is advanced forgiveness, because now you are not forgiving other people for something they've really done, you're recognizing that they haven't really done anything. So you're actually forgiving yourself for dreaming them. That distinction is vital. Without it, you're doing the old-fashioned kind of forgiveness, which can't undo the ego. Gary, how about another definitive idea? Arden, another one would be the idea that anger is never justified. If you made the whole thing up, then who is there to be angry at it? And a related definitive idea would be, the secret of salvation is but this, that you are doing this unto yourself. The two ideas fit together like a hand in a glove, and once you really get them then there's no getting away from them. Gary, cool. Give me another one. Arden, sure. The world you see is an illusion of a world. God did not create it, for what he creates must be eternal as himself. And fitting perfectly with that idea, whatever is true is eternal, and cannot change or be changed. Spirit is therefore unalterable because it is already perfect, but the mind can elect what it chooses to serve. The only limit put on its choice is that it cannot serve two masters. Gary, yeah, and it doesn't matter if you've heard that before, you just keep getting it deeper and deeper if you keep practicing advanced forgiveness. And if anything that can change or be changed isn't true, then that must cover everything in the universe of time and space. Arden, yes, and it also includes anything that is used to measure, test, or calibrate anything in the universe of time and space. It's not true, which we'll talk about later. Persa, one more definitive statement before we take off. Gary, go for it. Persa, forgiveness recognizes what you thought your brother did to. You has not occurred. It does not pardon sins and make them real. It sees there was no sin. And in that view are all your sins forgiven. I might add that only in that view are all your sins forgiven. If the world is real, then sins are real and they're guilty, which means you're guilty or at least that's the way it will translate into your unconscious. Get it? If they're innocent because they haven't really done anything, then you're innocent because you haven't really done anything. Once again, 
that's the kind of an idea that's definitive. You can't get away from it. And making it a part of you will make you whole. If they're innocent because they haven't really done anything, then you're innocent because you haven't really done anything. Gary, what does forgiveness do, then? Persa, J has your answer, brother. The miracle does nothing. All it does is to undo. And when the ego is undone, the truth will be all that's left. Arden, next time we can talk a little bit about that movie you wanted to discuss. We'd also like to talk about a couple of the memories you've had of your past lifetimes since the first series of visits. In addition, we'll talk about suffering, sacrifice, crucifixion, and death. Gary, wow! Popular subjects. Especially death. Oprah, here I come. Persa, somehow with you, Gary, it always ends up being entertaining. We love you for that. Gary, I love you too, Persa. Oh, you too, Arden. Thanks for talking to me through the Holy Spirit. It means a lot to me, including your guidance on what to do with the book. You keep everything on course, no pun intended. Arden, no problem. Keep practicing, brother. We'll be watching. With that, they appeared to be gone, and I appeared to be getting ready for another trip to Canada. The weather was warm, and I felt grateful for summer, for my two friends, and for all the new friends I was making because of them.